Men are going through something right now and we are not acknowledging it. It's all these dads yeah. with their kids and they look so happy. And yeah. it was like the very last video that they, mm -hmm. that the wife had taken. And you would never know. Majority of my friends, they're widows, not from war, from suicide. There's gonna be lawsuits like you've never seen. Well, Kelsey, welcome to the Chatting with Candace podcast. I'm yes. so excited to finally have you here. And I know we were going back and forth, but I'm so glad that we decided to do in person, especially after dinner last night and just catching up with you. So thanks for thanks for coming to the land of the free. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm always wanting to come to the land of the free. Any excuse I get to be here and feel just calm in a different place where people aren't watching me every couple seconds and people aren't being crazy and wearing masks and yelling at me. It's a really welcomed state. So thanks for having me. Oh yeah. Anytime. Um, so I have been watching a ton of your content and I have all of these notes and I'm don't even know where to begin. I guess the whole reason that you kind of came on my radar is I saw you on Drinking Bros and then I watched your trigonometry episode and it was the very end of trigonometry when you start bringing <laughs> up Maiden. I'm like, this is the whole thing I wanna get get into and then I yeah. realized there's so much more overlap that we have and we kind of figured that out even more at dinner. Um, but I guess like jumping in to Maid because that's kind of where you left off yeah. on the last podcast. I guess, what is that for listeners okay. that aren't aware and what got you involved in being outspoken about it? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for asking that. A lot of people are, are starting to catch on, but there, there's not quite enough yet, in my personal opinion, enough where we've been able to stay the bill, meaning we've been able to stop it in its tracks. Um, and we have an opportunity to completely eradicate it from the legislation in Canada. So for people who don't know or haven't listened to that episode or listened to any of the episodes I've done on MAID, MAID is medical assistance in dying. MAID is being used as a euthanasia program in Canada. I compare it very much to eugenics. If you were to look back in World War II and the verbiage that was used with Hitler and his, his cronies and everyone else, the verbiage is very much similar in Canada right now. The problem with MAID is not that we are giving grown humans who have terminally ill um, cancers, diagnoses, really painful exits out of this world, an opportunity to leave in a compassionate way, but it is being utilized and exploited. Uh, we now have, whew, in 2021, we had 10,500 Canadians uh, use MADE. It was over 13,500 by 2022, and I don't know the full stats, but we know that it's over 30% and it keeps increasing. The problem with MADE is the Canadian government is not using it as a way to actually help the ill. They're using it as a cost saving alternative and a way to control population. The reason I state that, and that's a really aggressive um, description, and I really believe that wholeheartedly, is because we've seen how they are and have attempted to amend the bills to allow for mentally ill, mm -hmm. addicts, homeless, and children that are terminally ill down to the age of 12 with parent consent. Part of the problem in Canada is if a child who's 16 or 17, child, nor I said child, who cannot make a decision at that age, walks into a hospital and says, I'm suicidal, more often than not, they will offer you made before they will hold you to protect yourself from yourself. We've seen it. There's a ton of evidence for it. It's happened in hospitals near me. It's happened in hospitals across the country. But in particular, British Columbia, where I live, is uh, it, comparable to the rest of the country. BC has got the highest rates. Okay. Now you could look at that in a multitude of ways. Cost of living is the highest in Canada and British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Land is un uncontrollably large. Like it is, you cannot afford to live there if you don't have multiple incomes, you know, a spouse income. And if you can afford to live there, you've got a, you know, a crazy job where you're making, you know, six figures plus easily. With the issues that we have on the east side of Vancouver, which is one of the largest, if not the largest opioid epidemic space in the world. North America, almost the world. We have never seen anything like this. We have open air drug markets. You can go buy heroin and cocaine on the streets. You can buy fentanyl. In Canada, Health Canada boxes. Okay, so what we did is Canada, you know, we emptied out the psych wards way back at a Riverview. We took everybody out. We put them all in the streets. The mental health epidemic is out of control. And then we started saying to people out of, and this is the guides of what the Canadian government has stated, out of compassion and empathy, we would like to be able to offer these people 
a choice in their life. Mm -hmm. Well, there's this really, and I would love for you to do a dive on them because I feel like you would get somewhere. There's this organization called Dying with Dignity. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dying with Dignity is evil. Is that, are they in relationship with MAID or are they yeah. separate entities? They're pushing it. Okay. They're the ones pushing the bills. They're the ones funding it. They've got over $7 million on average sitting in their bank account. They're funded from somewhere and I'm trying to figure it out right now. Okay. So MAID, the expansion was pushed forward with them. They were, they were lobbying. They were doing everything they could to. And what we've figured out is, and we've got leaked footage of them training doctors stating that here's a case study here's stacy stacy has a bunch of debt because stacy's ill well stacy can't afford her to look after herself anymore so due to her credit card debt she should be a candidate for maid this is public this is public i'll google it and send it to you <laughs> i had to come with receipts if i'm talking about anything like this because it's it's so much more than people are aware of, and that's because of Bill C-11. It's been strategically placed so that Americans and the rest of the world have a hard time seeing our media, and we have a hard time um, seeing your media unless we have VPNs. So the reason I got involved with MADE was I got a phone call a couple years ago from a friend, um, another veteran, and he was like, Kelsey, uh, one of our guys was just offered MADE. And I said, sorry? And he goes... He lives in another country. He called his case manager looking for support for post-traumatic stress disorder and a traumatic brain injury. This is an ex-special operator, should 100% be given the support he needs. And in that, there's a voice recording of the case manager offering made. So he, he, wasn't, he wasn't alluding to being suicidal. He wasn't looking for that answer. He was looking for genuine help to heal. And they offered a made, and that, sparked a fire because they already use us as numbers. We're already expendable people. That's why when you get hurt, they're so quick to med board you out. You would think with the financial investment they put into you, they would want to keep you and turn you and get you healthy and then keep you in the service. That's not the case. So what had happened was he said, look, I'm going to leak this to a few people. We're going to send it to Rebel. We're going to send it around and see what happens. They did that. Then there was an inquiry brought into Ottawa. A couple other people came forward, other veterans. Um, another individual I've had on the show, uh, Christine Goche. She's a Paralympian. She's a Canadian Olympic rower. She is also uh, an Invictus Game gold medalist. She was one of the first artillery gunners. She's the people who paved the path for me. And due to the way she was told to do her training, she actually sustained a spinal injury because she, they didn't listen to the doctors. So she had then grown through the service with this injury due to service that was unnecessary. And she just needed wheels for a wheelchair and a wheelchair ramp to get in and out of her home. They offered her maid. We have all the documents. And then what we started to realize is how many people have been offered maid instead of treatment. After that, we kind of got a couple of us together and said, okay, we're gonna start tackling this. They did the inquiry, it was an absolute disaster. They gave the veterans five minutes each and then afterwards told them to their face that they're lying and that they had no proof. And then when the Veterans Affairs Minister went on Mercedes Stevenson, the, white, um, the West Block, the, he lied right to her face and said, no, it's only been one. When we have so much proof to prove otherwise, and they said it was only one case manager, but we found out it was different genders, so a male and a female, and they were on other um, different parts of the country in different offices. So this means this was being slow rolled out and it always starts with veterans. Anything always starts in the veteran area, right? How can we exploit them and see what they'll push back on? And then we'll roll it to the rest of the world. And that's exactly what happened. The reason it got a lot heavier for me and I got brought into it a little more was a friend of, mutual friend of mine who owns this flooring company in BC called King of Floors. He's like, Kelsey, you got to talk to this woman named Alicia Duncan. And I was like, okay, why? Like, why? Relax, relax. He got very amped. Her mother was killed with maid. And I was like, okay. And he goes, yeah, we don't think it was lawful. And I was like, whoa, okay. So the police were involved in this case. Long and short, Alicia and her daughter, uh, sister, sorry, Alicia and her sister have been fighting and are currently fighting for medical records because her mother was a psych nurse for over 20 years and she had no mental health history at all. She got in a car accident, sustained a massive traumatic brain injury. And in Canada, where everyone thinks we have healthcare, it was over 18 months for her to see a specialist. And within a couple months, she went from perfectly healthy to pinning her bed sheets, 40 pins, like everything had to be smooth, purating all of her food. She wouldn't leave the house because she thought someone was gonna sniper her. 
Wow. And they brought this all forward and behind everyone's back in the family, they went, she went to the hospital and asked for maid. But here's where it got really dicey. All of the hospitals she went to are a conflict of interest. She used to run the hospital. So that's what maid does is they don't inform the family members to stop it. They don't, they don't tell anyone. Mm -hmm. They don't ask for support. Hey, is there any other people around you we can talk to? They just take you on your word. What then happened was she was getting to the point where it was coming up and her partner said like, you have to tell the girls. So she told the girls and they got a court injunction and they got her held. And they said, we're in control now because you're not of sound of mind. And that's the whole thing made is, right? Is there's two tracks and one has to be foreseeable death and one has to be unforeseeable, but something that is so damaging and life altering. suffering. Yeah, great. So they, they consider, yeah, they have verbiage for it. But that being said, they are exploiting these two tracks because one track can be done in a really short period of time and the last track can be done up with up to 90 days. So long and short, they got the court injection. The mother was so upset, she slit her wrists, okay? They found her on the floor. They brought her to the hospital. They held her. Two days later, they enacted made on her. By definition, under your own rules, you have to be sound of mind to make this decision. It's very clear that mm -hmm. you were not. And so there is a lot more to that story. And we talked about it. I had Alicia on the show. Um, we talked really in depth about her mother's case and what's going on there. And she is one of the most beautiful examples of what happens when you mess around with the wrong family. And because of her and so many of the other people in Canada, the new rollout was supposed to happen on March 17th. And that got stopped dead in its tracks. And that was all being funded and pushed forward by uh, Dying With Dignity. Because they said, you know, if you're a rape victim, you shouldn't have to live through that. So you should enact MAID. Prisoners in Abbotsford Prison who were on life were choosing to use MAID and the government was paying for it. So there is so much more that's coming out. I'm in a rebel documentary that's coming out. I think it's gonna be out this month. Uh, Alicia and I are in another documentary with the UK with Liz Carr about this as well and the dangers of it. And really it is eugenics wrapped around this compassionate, empathetic bow of we should help everyone. No one should be in any pain or suffering. We need better palliative care. We need preventative medicine. And we need to not let people get to this point where they think that they are better off dead than living on this earth. And it's tragic. So that's my whole involvement is you mess around with my people and I have a voice, I'm gonna use it. Yeah, it seems, um to find the difference between what is considered suicide and then made, there's it's very gray because I, initially I when I first heard about this and um, like those pods that were getting popular I think in Switzerland the or death Sweden, pods? yeah, <sighs> for someone who's terminally ill, I think of course right like I, I just had to put my dog down like that is the compassionate thing to do and if we say that an animal suffering is not okay I think a person suffering from a terminal illness should also have that option because yep. otherwise you're leaving them to do it themselves and that's terrifying and dangerous and so if you can make it like quote safe and mm -hmm. painless and so that they can have dignity at the end. That makes sense. But then you get into this to this slippery slope. And I usually hate those arguments because people kind of use them to start from one point to get to something that's more ideological. And they're like, well, of course, this is going to be the natural progression. And you would say, well, no, uh, you know, of course, um, this exists in other countries. We do, again, right. do it with animals. Like this just seems like a, a medical ne like necessity. Mm -hmm. And then you do see that they're trying to get it for 12 year olds. So that has been pushed to 2027, correct? Yeah, so they're, they're essentially stating that the next election is where we're gonna see an opportunity. If the conservatives get in and Pierre gets in, that bill is gonna be cut. And, and here's the thing that happens, and I'm sure you guys have seen this in America, I know you have they will sandwich bills into other bills. And that's what they did with this. So it's called like hog something. I don't know what it's called. There's a, for my um, father-in-law, he's super into politics. He's <laughs> like, this is just the way of politics. And you, it, I wish I wish I could Google it. Cause I don't even know how I would begin to Google that phrase, but yeah, it's very normal for mm -hmm. like, I'm going to get this, I'll give you this. And then by the end of it, this, you have a thousand page bill where everyone needs right. to get a piece. And what had happened was Canada was reinforcing their abortion bill and they slipped it in. Mm. So this is how it got extended. Um, they had the sunset clause. And that is the thing that was terrifying was it was originally supposed to be in 2023. 
And then they pushed it to 20. And that's when I went and I did Pierce and we were talking about it. And he was like, what's going on? And then it got pushed to 2024. And then we started getting as loud as we possibly could and talking to anyone that would listen and just tagging every major person. And I always wondered, I, I thought to myself, why isn't Jordan talking about this? Because our media is so heavily censored by Bill C-11. He's one of the only ones that's got that escape velocity in Canada. And I thought mm -hmm. to myself, I'm like, why? I, I really wish somebody much bigger than me, because I can only yell as hard as I can yell, but I wish somebody much bigger than me would, would grab the reins of this and maybe break it down and go, okay, we need to be discussing this because the majority of Canadians have no idea. And that's the wild thing. So Alicia and I are actually planning to go out on the streets and we're going to interview some people and just ask them what's made. Because mm -hmm. most individuals have zero clue, meaning because they have no clue, their children have no clue. But what has happened is when they included younger individuals, we understand a lot of times those can be that uh, group think, that social ideology that um, can get captured within that age. And what we've seen with so many other movements is they're going to exploit it. Mm. And the dangers and the fears are groups of younger humans convincing each other it's a better idea to die, almost like a suicide pact, if you will, that's funded by our taxpayer dollars. And then you have companies like Simon's Department Store. Have you heard this story? Mm -mm. Oh, you're going to love this. So they've taken it down since, obviously. But think of like the Bay. It's a similar, it's a Canadian department store. They carry everything. They're from Quebec, which tracks. And they decided to use Maid as one of their commercials. So they had a female who was going to be uh, ending her life. And they decided to put her on a beach with all of their home goods, with bubbles all around, talking about how she was so excited to go end her life while she was surrounded by these waves and these cliffs and these beautiful home goods, selling the home goods under the eyes of maid is an acceptable, beautiful, welcomed thing and I can't wait. What? Younger, impressionable people are gonna be seeing that and it's the subliminal messaging, it's the, it's the couple touch points. And so that was disgusting to me. How can a department store use assisted suicide as a way to make an ad that's gonna be seen by very impressionable people across, across the country? Canada can't advertise pharmaceuticals, correct? We can't, but because a lot of people's TV overlaps with American TV, we see them anyway. Oh, so you'll get our advertisements? Yeah, so I don't have TV, I, we have Netflix. We have Netflix or we have Amazon. So I don't see any commercials anymore, but when we come to America and I turn the TV on, it's it's jarring. Yeah, it's weird because I believe it's the U.S. and uh, New, Zealand, New Zealand, and we're the only two in the world that are allowed to have pharmaceutical ads. And that seems, I mean, do you know who Joe Dispenza is? Yes. So he gets into um, kind of like the quantum physics and also like the subconscious um psychology behind these ads and how really dark and insidious it is and it, it's down from you know f you want to be able to kind of put yourself in a situation and that's when you become extremely malleable and in, like easily influenced so they get you with the dark music they make you feel very yeah. visceral then they'll show a really violent gnarly disease yeah. and it just gets you on every basic human instinct and then all, all of a sudden you're calling your doctor and then you have this illness and you maybe you start being a hypochondriac whatever you end up buying the thing that they're trying to sell so if you have a country like Canada that says you're not allowed to um, advertise pharmaceuticals because it's just not ethical how do you advertise a suicide it's not a pod. I don't know. I don't think they're doing the pods yet, but no. it's like still a package. They were talking about you can walk in and ask your doctor about it. It's it's no different. Yeah. So we've had. Rep so here's what's really wild. I've kind of now gotten to the place where in Canada, people just start to send me all their cases and their stuff to talk about because they're like, no one else is really discussing it other than rebel. And th the issue with that is it's heavy mm -hmm. and I'm happy to do it. That's, I'm okay to do it and I'm happy to, to take that on, but it's heavy. And what I will say is you start to realize how many people have been killed in really dicey ways. And to the point in which family members weren't told and nurse practitioners were doing it. And now they're discussing making it optional to not do it in a home or in a hospital. You can go to a park and they'll kill you there. Like it's- In a park? Yeah. So it's a public space. Yeah, but it's with the medical professional and it's just so- the conversation is getting really dark, really, really, really fast. And the suicide pods are one thing, but even then I think that's 
devoid of um, empathy and emotion, putting somebody in a pod and saying, we're going to ask you three questions and then we're going to gas you to death. Like that to me, just that pod scares the living hell out of me. And I think when people are going to pass and doctors are going to enact that in a palliative care setting, other family members should be around them. They should be held. People should be holding their hands. People should be praying for them. People should be in the rooms. Like I get emotional. Oh, I really am not okay with this. And it, it this is not like a, a clickbait let's talk about it. Let's, this is my life. And this is something I'm fighting so hard against because my son is young. And what happens when he gets upset one day and the wrong person says to him, he, well, just, you know what? It's so much better when you die anyway. Yeah. I'm, I'm genuinely very afraid for Canadians. And I'm more afraid that people don't know it's happening and they're impressionable. And I don't have another choice, but to yell about it because I, our legislation, they have a committee that is looking at MAID. These people have come through and talked to every physician and almost every single major physician that runs their province has come forward and said, we are not ready for this. Mm -hmm. Canada is not ready for this. That's not the answer that it should be. The answer should be no country is ever ready to allow people down to the age of 12 who are perfectly healthy. You took an oath, a Hippocratic oath as a doctor to say that you'll do no harm and that you will always try to heal people. You know that depression is healable. We know that it's a gut health issue. We know that it's a brain injury. We know that it's a chemical imbalance. So how could you ever say to someone, you will never heal from this? That's just not fact. We understand there are a ton of people in North America that have a genetic component that causes them to feel more manic, bipolar, schizophrenic. We understand that comes from food we eat, the lack of movement, the lack of water and sunlight. We're humans, yet we treat ourselves like we're robots and we wonder why we feel disconnected and unhealthy and sad. We need to go way back to where it worked, closer to the earth, closer to the sun, closer to others, hugging people. Like when I hugged you yesterday, <laughs> you hugged me. I was like, no, no, I'm not done. I'm so sorry. I am hugging people. Once you hit 10 seconds, you get a release, right? You get the oxytocin, and the dopamine. It's, but that feels like an uncomfortable amount of time, doesn't it? It's only it? an uncomfortable amount of time for people who are not comfortable being around other people. I, I did a hug at, I had a hug the other day at a, at a retreat. It was a four minute hug. That's a long period of time. I don't know if I've ever done that in my life. Right. <laughs> but it was actually one, I encourage people to just try it once in their life. It's really beautiful. And it really makes you feel connected to another soul. And I think that's the difference is we're so disconnected. We're so obviously disconnected on a continuous basis that we don't have the right empathy. We have the taught empathy, but we don't have the feeling of empathy. Mm -hmm. They're very different in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I try to think of the more sinister perspective. Like why would they be pushing Ooh. this? Cause the money doesn't make sense to me and it might sound like a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not, I, right. it was the annual savings is projected to be, and this is a huge swing. So I don't know who's doing their numbers, but between 34, and $136.8 million a year. That's not a lot for a country. So 2021, they saved $86.9 million. Okay. On not providing, by doing that. But that's made, not a lot. But if you do that, but think about this. If you do that at the small number they're doing it, mm -hmm. before a full expansion rollout, mm -hmm. then you, you factor in the amount that it's going to take to put somebody in proper care mm -hmm. for mental health. So say you get a 14-year-old who's depressed. Well, maybe they are bipolar. Okay, well, let's think about the follow-up care, the amount of time on doctors. When we, Canada is already so short, you, it's death care. We can't get in. A, you cannot get into a doctor unless you go into the emergency and then you're there for a day. People are dying in the waiting rooms constantly. So think about it's not just the financial number. Think about everything else that goes with it. Take, take veterans for an example because this is where I can speak to a little more um, from an educated perspective. GWAT happened. So Afghanistan, Iraq finished. Well, we had X amount of people that go. We had X amount of people come back with post-traumatic stress disorder, some form of mental illness or cancers from um, burn pits and exposure. You name it, uh, people who lost limbs, amputees who need um, new limbs on an ongoing basis. And then you've got their pensions. Then you've got their pay. So when you add up the amount of money 
that is actually saved from one person who's maybe a burden on the system. Mm. This is not just a financial uh, medical play for, for savings. It's a, the actual individual and what that person costs the government on an ongoing basis. And our veterans, most of the time, we were looking at like what, 18 to 27 year olds. Okay, so you have to look after them until you're 75. That's expensive and that is huge on the system. And then you turn around and we're giving crazy amounts of money to Ukraine. So Canada can't sustain that the same way America can't. So the best way to do is remove the burdens from the system, just like they did in World War II, you know, the people that needed a little extra help and all of this out of compassion, then you're freeing up crazy amounts of capital. So the number may not seem big, but when you break it down, it, it is quite large. And it also seems like such a paradox that the country that's doing the most innovative work with psychedelics for specifically PTSD is also pushing something like this. I think it was maybe on the trigonometry episode or maybe I watched Vox too and they did a debate between someone that worked at MAID versus a psychologist that was very, um, very hesitant about it. And I think they were talking about, I think it was also a veteran that came in and it was the first thing that they offered. Yeah. Because, and to her, she's like, well, you know, it's not a good option. It's tricky. It's really tricky if you're on a wait list and you know that if you can just wait long enough, if you can, you know, outlast the clock, this thing on the other end will help you. Right. But that waiting period, she had no problem with them using maid while they were on a wait list. And she's like, well, it's just, it's tricky. It's not tricky. It's not like, it's not tricky. How is that sound of mind? And uh, I don't know. It just seems wildly unethical and kind of like malpractice. It, in my personal opinion, it is. And you know, what's going to end up happening is the same thing. That's going to happen and you're about to see what's going to happen with all of the detransition de and all of the doctors. There's going to be lawsuits like you've never seen coming. I was watching someone talk about that and they actually, they didn't think that the lawsuits are going to end up happening because you have all the institutions as that is the proper protocol. Oh, the so there is no misalignment between what the doctors are doing at these clinics versus what the institutions of like pediatrics mm. are suggesting. So if there was a discrepancy there, then technically the doctor was acting out of line, but because the institutions are captured that no one's going to be able to actually sue. Maybe your parent, maybe you'll be able to sue your parent. You could. I'm not sure. There, there's got to be a line there for for some sort of consequence because realistically the long-term damage is obvious and we're seeing it with more and more individuals coming out and speaking about it. The same with MAID. You can't just kill people while their families don't know and give them an opportunity. Well, here's, I'm so torn. I'm really torn. I, the kids is a full stop. No to me, like okay. full stop. No, where I'm torn is I am a freedom maximalist, right. like in the truest sense of yeah. the word. So long as you're not infringing on other people's freedoms mm -hmm. and other people's safety, I don't necessarily want to live in a place where government tells me what I can and can't do with my body. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, there's always that other option and that's always existed. And this just seems like a cleaner alternative to someone who's in a ton of pain. Like think, and I'm not talking if you're about in a ton depression. Of pain. Yeah. I'm not talking depression, right? Like we should offer those people like compassion and other forms treatment. of treatment, right? We shouldn't be like, here's this <laughs> bye-bye. Like I don't think that that is the right thing at all, but I also don't want it necessarily to be fully illegal, I guess. I don't know. But then again, you have the slippery slope. So, um, I just lost my train of thought. So I'll, here, let me give you an example. Um, Liz Carr brought this up to me. It was it helped me shift my perspective a little bit because I could see it through her eyes. So Liz Carr is a disabled actress from the UK. She's been in Loki and Omen and all of these. I had no idea when I met her. She was like, yeah, I'm an actress. Look me up. I was <laughs> like, okay, okay, girl. And anyway, she's wonderful. She's wheel wheelchair bound. Um, she was born with a certain disorder where her, I think it's like her bones didn't develop quite accurately. So she is a quite tiny, fragile female, but oh my God, she is a badass. So she goes, look, Kelsey, let me, let me reframe it for you. Because I was very much the exact same as you. And she goes, the UK doesn't have this yet. And this is why we're fighting this. Once a bill goes into place, you don't get to decide what's amended and walks through. Mm -hmm. That's the concern. And so, yes, and I'm, again, I'm in full agreement. over 18, mm -hmm. 
terminally ill terminally ill mm-hmm. you have every right to end your life and i right. believe that and the is fact that it's not legal and so like, i think we have a handful of states where it's legal and if mm-hmm. you've ever had a grandparent or great grandparent that had dementia or alzheimer's it's a ton of pain mm-hmm. they're not there anyways no. i right now in sound of mind i can tell you if i'm in my 80s 90s whatever and that happens to me like please you know yeah help me out and jordan peterson did answer a question it was one of these panels that he did and it was him and his wife tammy and i think it was a cra- like someone in the crowd had submitted okay. what do you think about made and of course it's jordan peterson so it was a 20 minute answer <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth the answer it's very emotional it's very vulnerable and he explains how when he was really sick that in the thick of it he's like yeah. i can't do this for another day and he doesn't necessarily give a binary answer of yeah. course but it is what he alluded to or my perception of his answer was that back in the day if you had grandma that was really sick or someone with cancer the doctor would maybe over prescribe over mm. um prescribe or induce like uh, some kind of uh painkiller right. and then they would fall asleep and not wake up and he said that, that burden had to weigh on that individual and the family and it was this very intimate decision and right. he seemed to be okay with that but i think the mass rollout and kind of the commercialization is where he seems to be mm-hmm. not so on board which i understand but i guess that way when that was the norm you had to kind of nudge nudge to get someone out of pain that didn't seem right to me at all because I'm like how are you making that illegal and again if we do it for our dogs and our horses why can't you do it for someone who's terminally ill and it's just unfortunate that everything kind of has to get bastardized and you have something that could be good and helpful and you start wanting to make more money instead of caring about people and I think that that's what's happening that's the concern right and we Canada has had this since 2016 right Carter versus Canada she came forward it was a British Columbia woman and she she says I want to be able to die on my own terms and she she challenged the courts and she won and that's when it started to become legal but after that we saw this really rapid uptick really scary so would you have a different opinion if there was a certain protocol so let's say you go in and you have debilitating depression Mm. and like truly debilitated and i've had to debil- but I, what if they say you have to um go to counseling you have to do psychedelic treatment at yep. maps you have to do it for two years Kay. sign up for two years and then you still that is a last resort does that change anything i think part of the problems is the protocols that are in place are not sufficient even a little bit and they are borderline a framework at best uh the individuals that are pushing it i have no clue what they're saying you can do it with a nurse practitioner Mm -hmm. you don't need a specialist you don't need a doctor you Mm -hmm. need a nurse practitioner which I get they are also trained but you are not a doctor and that's okay I just think there's always going to be people that will take advantage of Mm -hmm. these situations and part of the problem is if we allow things to open more there's always going to be dark motives and evil motives that come in and we're seeing it Mm -hmm. here's my thing when people say they have debilitating depression, by definition, I, I am diagnosed with uh, treatment resistant depression. I've been suicidal. I was for seven years straight. Um, suicide attempt, like you name it, I've been there. Uh, they labeled me with post-traumatic stress disorder, major depressive disorder, treatment resistant depression. And I had postpartum after my son. Mm. So then I'm a full candidate. I'm a full candidate. Um, hearing loss, I'm a candidate. Uh, neurodivergent because of a traumatic brain injury. I am a candidate. So neurodivergency is a so yeah there mm-hmm, yeah. So there was an, a man that was killed. Um, he was depressed and was neurodivergent, fully functional, living on his own, and he had hearing loss. And so he was a candidate. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. So there isn't this the line for me, and I've I've really sat with this because it, this is a hard one. You're talking about people's lives and. What I've concluded for me personally is if you are not terminally ill, foreseeable death, meaning painful, excruciating, uh, nobody should have to live through that. And you're not over the age of 18. We're not having the same conversation. Mm -hmm. It is going to be abused. Full stop. I think psychedelic assisted therapy is one of the best ways to alleviate the uh, end of life anxiety. So I'm one of 160 Canadians that has legal and regulated access to regulated psilocybin. I had to go through the special access program, which is extensive and time consuming and financially crazy. And most people who are terminally ill cannot go through it. And they turn down over 90% of candidates. 
their answer to me before giving me mushrooms was, what about electroshock therapy? They thought that was better? And the only reason I did not have to do that before I was given access to psilocybin was because I had a traumatic brain injury. And when we told them that, wait, it gets better. They said, if she throws an epileptic fit, it's okay. She'll be unconscious and we'll manage it. When you have <laughs> electroshock therapy, it is a non-invasive lobotomy that they cannot control what it kills. I thought that was illegal. No, it's, it's one of Canada's solutions to major depressive disorder. Is it legal in the States? Do you know? I'm not sure about that, but I would, I would assume in certain cases, but for treatment resistant depression. So when somebody says I'm debilitatingly depressed, well, I've been there and you can heal. Oh my gosh. You just absolutely can. I'm looking this up. Please look it up. Go for it. I love America and their Tobo Chico. God, it's so, so good. Great. It's so great. <laughs> so I get very excited about this. So it's the little thing. You know what it is? And that's the beautiful part about being able to come to the land of the free. So many, so many awesome it's things. It's still legal. Okay. So that, in the US. Yeah. And that is their solution to treatment resistant depression. So how are we prescribing that? And we're like, oh, this little mushroom that grows on the earth Correct. is the problem. Right. So I had to go through the, it took us eight months. They said, we'll give you an answer in a week. It took us eight months. And that was, there was lawyers and a pharmaceutical company and everyone was fighting for me to get this. Once I got access, then I did the treatment. Is it decriminalized fully in Canada? No. no. So you have to be part of a trial? You have to, well, it's not even a trial. You have to have special access through the special access program. Okay. And that is a one track and it goes to, I think it's like four people who make that decision for all of Canada and they get flooded. And this is most of the time it's, it's for terminally ill patients or treatment resistant. You have to fall under the category. So once they, we jumped through all the hoops and the only reason I was a candidate was because I had done 10 years of psychotherapy, every pharmaceutical drug under the sun, mixed with uh, intensive physical fitness, uh, diet, uh, traumatic brain injury treatment, and things were still there. And so when they finally came back to us, they said, okay, they have one last question. Uh, is she willing to do electroshock therapy? And what, what foundation is this or what? So the special access program is Canada, the okay. government. Oh, it's just government. It's the government. Have you applied for MAPS? I have not, no. Because they're doing, they are obviously doing psilocybin, but they're doing MDMA too. And MDMA mm. shows really promising yes, work, especially with vets. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I've never I don't it. think they're probably having a prerequisite of shock therapy. <laughs> Something tells me that they're, that's not their jam, but right? I could be wrong. I, yeah, I, I would really be surprised if it was just because we know that it, it does more damage than it works. It's, this isn't the 50s. And we also don't know the brain. We still have no yeah. idea about right. the brain. So we were talking uh, last night about this person that had a tumor and and it caused all of these yeah. ailments. And you don't even know what part of the tumor and what combination of the mm -hmm. pressure on the brain was causing a complete shift in this person's personality. Mm -hmm. So um, to just say, let's just shock the whole thing and see what happens, like a reboot, it's not the same thing as your Apple computer. No, not even a little bit. It'll kill parts of the brain that don't come back. Whoa. So that's the thing that's terrifying. And you know, we did this in the 40s and 50s when we didn't understand. We still don't fully understand, but what we do understand is that... Our food is a big component of depression. Mm -hmm. Our social media use and consumption is. Our lack of um, nutrients, if you will, our move, our lack of movement. You know, there's so many different things that are a proponent that ramp up depression. And COVID was a beautiful one. We, mm -hmm. we, you know, one of the best ways to do is isolate humans, and that's how you make people sad. And it's because we need to be connected. So you're seeing this increase right now and people coming out with depression. People aren't depressed. People aren't taking action. And that is one of the ways that you can, and I get it, people are like, Kelsey, but have you never been in your bed before you can't get out? No, 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 I have. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 I have. But what had happened was I had a huge support network around me that was like, that's fine, you wanna lie in bed today, but you're gonna have to get up to go pee and we're gonna make you. Cause you, we know you're gonna have to and you're gonna take a step. And even if you take one step out of that bed today, that's a win because you can heal from it. And anybody who says you can't has never truly been to the depths and that is my play zone. So I know how to get out of that. And most people can, if they have the right people around them, the problem is, is the influence around them. Are they a burden to the family? Does the family see them as that? Well, then they, will they push then made? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes uh, with the children, you've got the Munchausen by proxy issue, which mm -hmm. people are going to take advantage. Everyone is currently. Then you've got the individuals who are burdened on the system. So then you've got the people who are pushing it. And then you've got the individual themselves, which can't see, can't see tomorrow, right? That doesn't understand that 
your emotions are like waves and they mm -hmm. can suck for a long time, but you will come through the storm if you have the right people around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if you listened to Abigail Schreier's recent interview on Rogan. She was pushing this new book. I think right. it's called Bad Therapy. And she specifically got into some PTSD stats that I thought were really interesting. And I wanted to get your opinion on everything. Yes, I'm excited. So she was, um, the book is against therapy for people who don't truly need it. She thinks a lot of us are over prescribing it and that we aren't telling people that there actually are side effects to therapy, which I didn't know. Who would have thought that there are side effects to that? You thought right. you were going to talk to a professional air quote professional. professional. <laughs> um, so she was comparing the stats with Israeli soldiers mm -hmm. compared to Canada and the U S mm -hmm. and they're significantly lower, which I actually thought was surprising because they seem to kind of be constantly in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. And you would think that that would overtax your nervous system and that would create more PTSD. But what she found is so the stats for the Israeli soldiers are, and this is just roughly with 77 to 8.5% of soldiers that had PTSD, the U.S. was 11 to 23% and Canada was 6 to 17%. So huge discrepancy between Israeli soldiers yep. and the West. And her rationale for this was that in Israel, they'll take you out if some, like, you witness something bad, you get injured, they take you out, but then they throw you back in. Yep. And it's kind of that old school parenting, which is brush it off, kids, you're fine. Yep. Go back in there and not over validating your monkey mind yep. where here we're like therapy, 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 we label it. And then once we have that label, you create an identity. And then once you have that identity, boy, is that hard to shake. Mm -hmm. So you are depressed. You, you have are. personality, personality disorder. You have, right. And then you're like, I am depressed. Well, no, you just feel like shit. Don't right. label yourself as this. Otherwise you're going to perpetuate that thing. So what you see is that kind of uh, trickles down to the kids and then the kids have all of this angst because they're getting labeled and labeled prematurely and mm -hmm. then the effects of that. And then you see that with parenting. And I don't know how much the gentle parenting has taken over Canada, but has taken over the U.S. And there are definitely beautiful parts of it that I incorporate in my parenting. But I also have discipline, rules, boundaries, right. feedback. Like it's not a free for all. So it, gentle parenting is the kid falls down and scrapes his knee and you know it's not bad. What they tell you to do is not say you're okay because that says you're invalidating their experience mm. is you're supposed to say, are you okay? Is it a big hurt or a little hurt? Yeah. And that sounds great. And I was doing that. And Abigail's like, no, but if you look at the Israeli model, if it isn't, you know, it's not a bad injury, you're fine. So yeah. That's what I used to do until you see all this gentle parenting stuff. You're like, I'll try that and see how it feels. It seems more empathetic, but you're the adult in the room. So you actually yeah. are supposed to be the one that when they look to you, they're crying and you want to reassure them that, right. yes, this is painful. Not all pain is evil. You can do hard things and yes. you are fine. So yes. it's a difference between you. Maybe he fell off from the playground and you don't know if he's okay. Then you ask, are you okay? Right. But if it's something little you are okay, brush it off. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the brush it off method is invalidating feelings or do you think that that is kind of a necessary thing to create anti-fragility and resilience? So I'll tell you what I do with my son. Yeah. Which is a mix of both. In terms of the gentle parenting comes in for me where it's teaching him about his feelings, meaning are you feeling it in your stomach? Mm -hmm. Are you feeling it up here? We do is that it? too. Yeah, and because then that way they can describe to you if I'm upset, are you angry or are you anxious? Mm -hmm. Are you hungry or are you sad? Where is it hit in your body? So he can understand, well, we know that it sits here, so we know that it's not this. And then you've got the other side of me where it's, you know, our, my son is a, is a terror. That guy is a ripper. He doesn't stop from 4 a.m. <laughs> to 7, and he has put his teeth through his lips more times than I can count. Oh. Yeah, he's, he's a ruthless kid. But I'm... If I know he's okay, I mean, I was a paramedic, like, you're good, bro. And he'll look to you and he'll look at your face and you go, you're good. It's just a little scrape, man. You got this. You got it. Move on. You're good. So if they're, I don't ask him if he's okay. If I, cause I can see it most of the time. Mm -hmm. If, if he's got a head injury or he's broken an arm, I'm like, well, you're good, but we're going to get that fixed. Mm -hmm. No big deal. Does it hurt? Yeah. Okay. Does it, how much does it hurt? One to 10. And then we go from there. Mm -hmm. So we help him self-diagnose rather than tell him how he feels if it's something severe. Now, this is this is interesting. So <clears throat> ironically, Jocko asked me something on my first episode that actually was a really good question. And I enjoyed it because no one asked me. He goes, do you think if you weren't ripped away from the British the way you were 
and somebody sat down with you and said, hey, Kels, what you're feeling, totally normal. What you're going through, 100% expected. This though, you got to move through it. You can't hold it. Mm -hmm. But instead, I was told, you're broken, you're injured, it would have been less paperwork if you died, take these 11 drugs, go back out to the gun. Here's the thing. I didn't need to go back out to the gun. I needed to stay with the British people I was just hurt with. And I needed to go back out mm -hmm. and get not over it. Closure. But I need, yes, a thousand percent. Now that may be harsh for some people and there are levels to this game, right? Mm -hmm. There are some people who genuinely shut all the way down and you're not, they're not going back out there. It's and then not, you're a risk to other people. You're a risk to others, you're a risk to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I get that, but I wasn't at that point. I was at the point where if they would have got me and been like, okay, hey, we're going back out again next week, it would have been hard but I know that I would have been able to process in that time frame. but they stopped the process and my ability to move through it by medicating and by saying you're broken and by telling me I had PTSD while I was in the country. Mm -hmm. So the labels were immediately put onto me and I was 19 years old. Yeah. So no, I agree with the, a mix of the method because there, like I said, there are levels to the injury. You can see them and they present pretty obviously really quick. Um, that being said, it is, it is hard to send people back out because you don't know if they're going to be a risk to other people. It, it, it's no longer just about that person. It's mm -hmm. about the person to the left and right. So it has to be looked at differently. But I can fully understand why Israelis would be, you know, less prone maybe to post-traumatic stress disorder. Look at North America in general. Look at the way that we treat people when they get hurt or their injuries. We coddle, we coddle, 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 and we helicopter parent like it's crazy. And we create these anxious states for people and tell them that they're everything from the sun. And then of course, I was for sure one of those captured individuals with this is my label. And I had to sit with that for a long time. And there was a moment I remember in therapy where I sat there and I was like, I don't think I'm this thing anymore, but it's terrifying because if you're not that thing, then who are you? Mm -hmm. Because you didn't know who you were when you were always medicated. You don't know who you were for the past seven years, your whole twenties. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like moving forward? That's the fear of, of leaving the label is, is terrifying. But once you're able to, you're able to realize that it was a label. That's what it was. And your body just wasn't given the chance to process. And it was held in time by all of the SSRIs and the uppers and the downers. So I agree that there needs to be some change made. And I think that's why the Israelis, I mean, they, it, Israel's been attacked for how many hundreds of years, thousands of years. They're born and bred in war. Mm -hmm. It's the same way when you go to Afghanistan or anywhere else. It's like these children, they don't flinch necessarily when they hear a bomb drop or a, a you know, an AK pop off. Ugh. They're, they're born around this. Their nervous system is developed in what I would say, a, stuck in a fight or flight state. And I'm not arguing that that's good because we understand what that does to the cortisol levels, the long-term damage to your body chemically. But of course, that makes sense why Israelis have less less of it because they are born and bred around it. So with the PTSD and then this juggling between you don't want to be a helicopter parent because right. that does create anxiety for the kid because they do need to have some kind of autonomy. But also you don't want to be like the boomer parents either who were right. kind of latchkey parents. I don't really have a lot of memories with mine. Like they were mm. either working or on vacation. They, mm. I kind of self-parented and parented my siblings. And if you see this pandemic or this epidemic happening with young men, like 18 to 40s, and they're killing themselves, mm -hmm. there was this compilation I posted yesterday. It gets me every time. It's all of, uh, it's so emotional. It's all these dads. Yeah with their kids and they look so happy. Yeah. And it was like the very last video that they, mm -hmm. that the wife had taken and you would never know. So with men, it looks, mm -hmm. uh, it looks totally different. So like, how do you check in without being a helicopter and how do you make sure sure like the boys and the men around you are okay? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, we have perpetuated this really negative stereotype in our culture called boys don't cry. I, I spoke about this on Meat Mafia. Mm -hmm. And I, the reason I, I bring it up is because it's not talked about enough. We, our men are going through something right now and we are not acknowledging it because of radical feminism and men don't matter and we can live this whole world without men. Well, joke's on you, you can't, so stop <laughs> pretending. Um, 
also, who who are you gonna call to to go fix the roof? Because it ain't gonna be you, girl. Yeah. Hannah um, Brown. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brown. exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, um, it's really rough. Um, you know, we've we've lost four times more people post war than we did in the war. Um, the majority of my friends, they're widows, not from war, from suicide. And so these children are growing up without parents. And whether it's the alcohol that's brought in, you know, it's a coping mechanism in the military, right? They won't let us use cannabis. They won't let us use plant healing modalities, but they'll give us, you know, alcohol and say, drink yourself to death. Like they don't care. You know, pre-deployment the week before we left, our guys had to be rushed out the back of the door because they were all doing coke that weekend and they would have popped positive. And so then we would have not had anyone to deploy with. So, you know... We, we created this culture of boys don't cry, don't talk about your emotions, and don't give you the tools to deal with it. Part of the thing that happens with uh, young boys, and I'm not a psychologist or, psycho um, psychologist or psychiatrist, but I will tell you, the majority of my friends are men. And the men that I see, it's the everyday stuff, and they have no one to talk to about it. That's what it is. And I don't know that there's any way to tell, because like you said, they look like nothing's going on. I believe it's now on us to open a door and start a conversation. And it, this is genuinely not a plug. This is just what I do because I don't know another way of doing it. Um, that's what my buddy packs are for, those bracelets, those packs of two. It's you call somebody up and you say, hey, let's just go for a walk or even for a beer. I prefer a walk, but if you want to go for a beer, you do you, boo. Um, and sit down and you just put the bracelet on the table and they go, what's that? And, you, and the conversation can start from there. It goes, how you doing, man? You don't have to be weird about it. Don't make it uncomfortable and be like, how, how are you feeling today? It's like, how are you doing, man? And most of the time, if you open the door, they'll walk through it, but they don't often get the door open for them with anybody they feel they can be 100% themselves with. And that's why I work in the psychedelic space. And the majority of people I work with are men. Mm -hmm. It's They're able to open up to me, whether it's the container I hold or the fact that I'm a woman and they feel like I'm going to be more empathetic mm -hmm. and less judgmental. But we have done a beautiful job over the past several decades of telling boys their, emo their emotions are not valid. Crying is a weakness. And that if they do any of those things, they're not seen as a man. Mm -hmm. And there was even, um, <clears throat> I've, I've, I brought her up before and I'm not picking on her, but she, she made a statement on this, this podcast. Um, I don't even know what the show is called. It's essentially a, a, a guy that sits there and then there's a whole bunch of girls and he just like yells at them and the you, whatever podcast that's it thank you yeah. that's the only way I can describe we're it we're big fans of that show okay yeah, on so, canceled weekly yeah, yeah. I, I think I've heard you talk about it before mm -hmm. but one of the turning points um contributors she went on there and she's like they're like what do you think of when men cry she's like I think they're weak and I think it makes them look pathetic and that shit right there that is the problem mm. women that think that when men cry they're weak the no 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 if a man is crying in front of you that is the, that he feels safe with you and courage whole. Yeah. Oh, Cause I'll bet you, they grew up being told that if they cried, they were weak. So it's this new generation of saying men don't need to exist and men that cry are weak. And we're telling men that they have no place here. Of course, people are going to be dying by suicide at unprecedented rates. They don't feel valued. They don't feel like they have a purpose. And what do we know about when you take purpose away? Mm -hmm. Everything falls. When somebody wakes up in the morning, they don't feel like they have a purpose. They don't want to be here. And that's the harsh reality. We need to stop telling men that crying is unacceptable, that their feelings are unacceptable, and completely flip it on its head and start educating these young girls who are delusional. Well, that goes down to a woman just not feeling safe in her own body. Oh, for sure. Right? It's protection. So it's you're so terrified of the world around you that anything that's perceived as a weakness on the male's end is now a threat to your personal self, like safety. So you're going after these very caricaturized versions of what a masculine is. And mm. it's the immature masculine that you're seeking out, not the integrated mature masculine, which is all of it. And I was talking to, um, what was that guy's name? I feel so bad. Dave Hurt. Is that his name? I think so. Uh, I'm so sorry if that's not your name. I'm. I thought. I think his first name's Dave. Yeah. Let me double check. The last name I could be wrong on. We talked about my memory last night. In my hamster. So. Well, I'm dealing with a time change and and uh, daylight savings. Yeah, Dave Hurt. 
Um, so he's like this big muscular man and he's a, a girl dad, which I always, it's my favorite. Cause that always tends to be how so it fun. works out. It's yeah. always the super alpha dudes that end up being girl dads. Uh, I think there's a lesson to be there, but mm -hmm. I'm like, no one's going to look at you and challenge that you are not masculine at all. But I guarantee being a girl dad, when those little girls run in, like all those muscles turn into mush mm -hmm. and you are just oozing love and empathy and all these things like you become soft around them and that doesn't mean you're feminine that is right. the mature masculine it's feeling safe and all of that and then for a woman to say that you know if he's crying that that's somehow not that doesn't make any sense it just means that you feel so unsafe and you're looking for someone to compensate that right. when the reality that can supplement it of course having a strong partner someone who's giving you certainty and providing leadership within your family of course that's necessary but if you don't feel whole by yourself if you don't feel safe by yourself no one else is going to give you that you have to figure that out by yourself mm -hmm. so going through all of your hardships and coming back and integrating into society and when did you meet your husband before or after uh, right before I deployed I was 18 okay so developing <laughs> that relationship yeah. how did you get to a place where you feel safe by yourself instead of because what I see from these women it's taking you're yeah. taking from your man and what's going to end up is you have a depleted partner yeah. because you can't do your own stuff. So how did you get to a place where you are filling your own cup instead of trying to like take from him or someone else mm -hmm. or mask it, whatever it is. Mask it for a long time. Mm -hmm. Like you can look at like when I was doing some of the biggest stuff with brass and unity, like we were in all these like fashion magazines and all of these things. And I've got this huge smile on my face, but I was dying inside dying, wanting to die every waking minute going to that office was just like, I'm, I can't do this anymore. Even had a child, had a great job, had, a, you know, a beautiful home, had everything. And yet I just wanted to die. Like, that's not right. There's something really wrong there. So there became a moment where radical accountability had to come into place. And I think you can, the mind is a very, very, ooh, magic tool. It is a superpower if you, if you teach it how to work. Now I had a psychiatrist who was in Rwanda and Bosnia during the genocide. And he was a medic. He was a, a colonel, a Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, he had done all the research on post Rwanda veterans when he came back for PTSD. And so he ended up getting me as a client. And this old man and my 19 year old self who just, I would sit and start talking about things and I would start sweating and shaking. And I would just be this in all of our meetings. I would get up and I'd be stuck to chairs and stuff. I was just pouring sweat. He asserted with me really quickly that a lot of what I was going through will heal as long as I was willing to do the work. And he will, he will walk with me and he's still my guy. I still check in, you know, every other week, every week. We're not talking about the same things and he's definitely progressed with me. But the nice part about it was I had somebody that had experienced what I experienced on a, on a way more insane level who was incredibly educated and looked me deadpan in the eye and says, we're going to be okay here. That's the, the serious amount of confidence that he, he was able to say that to, like it hit me and I was like, okay. If he says I'm going to be okay, I'm going to be okay. And once he was able to give me different healing modalities and we hit a plateau and I came to him and said, we have to shift here. He did not fight me on it. He didn't go, well, no, you're on medication. We can't do that. He goes, all right, girl, I trust you. Okay. You let me know what you need in the meantime. And when I was going off of my last SSRI that I was on for 10 years and I went off of it cold turkey, which Whoa, is so dangerous, so dangerous, the yeah. most dangerous. I had 30 days to be clean before I went to do some medicine mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to miss that for anything. Mm -hmm. It felt like the lifeline that I was so desperately needing. And he just said, you call me Brady's on speed dial. Everyone knew what was going on. And it was one of the worst pains I've ever gone through. That being said, as soon as I started using plant medicine, it gave me perspective it allowed me to go into the really dark, heavy things that had been walled off from trauma and break those open and, and go in and explore what those all were. Once I had radical accountability and I knew I had a safety net with a good doctor around me, everything started to shift. Everything. I've never been on a pharmaceutical drug since. It's been over four years. And I'm not the person who goes to sit in the jungle every month. You know, I go, <laughs> Good. no, no, Good. because I think um, the thing about psychedelics people miss is that uh, they're not a magic pill. Mm -hmm. They're an opportunity. They're an opportunity to learn. 
but you have to be willing to learn and you have to be willing to understand that you might not get the answers you think you want or you think you need, but you, what you're being faced with is exactly what you need. How, however dark or light, right, there's or no bad trip. There's no bad trip. There's a learning lesson in everything. And that's my approach to life though. This life is happening for you, not to you. Once I was able to truly m remove the victim mentality, everything shifted like radically. And, and that's how I was able to like start to make sustained and massive leaps in growth. I just think, Again, we're the labels, we, we're all the, like I told you yesterday, we're the stories we tell ourselves. So if we're telling ourselves these stories, I am, I am, I am, I am, we become. So the second you remove that layer of victim mentality and go, no, I, I am strong. No, I do have this. No, I will heal from this. This just might be rocky for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the psychedelic <clears throat> thing I think is so powerful. And I wish that there was something that was legal and kind of in between the mystical woo-woo you mm -hmm. have to go to Peru. Because while I think that that is probably the best, I've never done it. I do not feel called to it at all. That's like, good. Don't all. go if it's not a calling. I've had a lot of friends that have done it. And then I see people that get captured and that becomes their entire identity. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's good either. Mm -mm. But I do think that there is something to the indigenous people doing it, to doing yep. it in the jungle. I think that that probably is a wildly different experience than what people are doing at MAPS. And obviously they're different drugs as well, but um, just like the psychedelic experience in general. But that can be such a turnoff to someone who is a type A and doesn't want to get into anything esoteric. They would much rather do something like MAPS, but that's mm -hmm. only available at Johns Hopkins right. in Canada. We don't really have that in the States unless you find maybe an entheogenic church and then that's kind of gray as mm -hmm. well. And there's this guy, I think his last name is Angermeyer. He's a WEF guy. Oh, fun. Like, dun, dun, dun. Oh. But what they're trying to do is... <sighs> What's the word? Man, this is, time is fucking me up. Um, Nobody noticed. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Copyright, essentially. Mm. Psilocybin. So we've already done it in Canada. Really? Yeah. So it's like they own it. Yeah. So I actually did the clinical trial I did. What is the word? It's not copyright, but they, it's like the same they thing. They want to patent it. Patent. There yeah, you go. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what's happening. So psilocybin has been patented um, in Canada. In Canada. Yeah. So uh, I know that they've... Apex, so they're called Apex Labs. And um, they are out of their head office in Vancouver, but they're out of New Brunswick. And I did the clinical trial with them. So I sat with the macro dose of the synthetic psilocybin. Oh, it's synth. Oh, yeah, it does. It's synthetic. Yeah, so course, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's wild. Is it different? It's, okay, so how I can explain it is <clears throat> if anybody's ever sat with a macro dose of, of traditional psilocybin, mm -hmm. it's a longer, longer experience. Uh, it takes a little longer to jump into it, but this medicine was different. It was shorter in duration. And there was a, if you were to think like a tabletop on a jump, up, ramp, down. There is a entry point, but the difference is you had to initiate the conversation with the medicine. Normally with psilocybin, everything just kind of starts and you're just kind of in it. But this, you could feel at the onset was within 20 minutes, I was dropped in completely. And it's almost like I walked up to a door. And they're like waiting for me to open the door. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready to learn. And it's like the, and we're, whoa, and we're in it. So, and it's very strong, but it's very clear and very mm -hmm. clean. But the, the healer that was with me, she practices and trains with the Kutanawa in Brazil. Um, and she had sat down with their, their tribe and said, you know, is this, is this an integrity with the medicine? And what they came back with was that um, the medicine knows how, to make humans do what it wants. It knows what people are driven by, financial, ego, however it works. And so we sat with it and she worked with me on the ceremony and it was probably one of the more powerful ceremonies I've had. And I've done the jungle, I've done in America, I've done the trial, I've done all of these things and it was quite profound. And what was most intriguing to me about that was the how applicable it's going to be and case studies for individuals who, like you said, they don't want to dive into the mystical. They don't, they just want to, they want to heal mm -hmm. and they will do whatever it takes to heal. Now I'm a bigger proponent of that than I am of, you know, at home ketamine by yourself. Yeah. I really have a, I, I've tried to figure out what it is about ketamine that, that, that bothers me, but there's something there and I'm, I'm, I'm working through my thoughts on that. And so I, I don't want to go too far into it, but I, I don't love ketamine I know it works a lot for a lot of people and I've had a lot of people have incredible results but 
ketamine makes me nervous just because it's so readily available. It's completely legal. It can be prescribed to anyone. Telehealth. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I had this guy on my show and I went into this thing about how irresponsible it was to have a ketamine telehealth company. And he's like, I own a couple. Perfect. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well let's get into it because right. it is, we're finding out it is very addictive. You have people doing their own dosage. Is it a long-term solution? It is synthetic. And I guess where I was going with the synthetic psilocybin versus something that's more organic, I was listening to this guy talk, and he's kind of like out there spiritual guy, so take that for what it is. But he's saying that the reason that you can do certain drugs and not get lost, like psilocybin, like actual mm -hmm. magic mushrooms, and it's not neurodegenerative, it's not a toxin, like a neurotoxin, you can do it as many times as you want, mm -hmm. as we know, and um, you're in a company back it's because it's grounded in the earth mm -hmm. what happens when people do something synthetic is that is not of the earth it's not grounded it's made in a lab so you tend to get more ethereal and then that's when you have someone that does too much acid or lsd and they don't come back down right so it was like a really descriptive and maybe it's woo but it does seem to be something there because if you do look at more of these natural drugs and you look at these more synthesized ones which one tends to be more problematic mm -hmm. for for somebody. So with the synthetic psilocybin that I did, it's a direct derivative. And so it's grown in the lab and the way that they do it, it, it's given to me in a powder and then they put a little bit of water and then you shake it and you drink it. Mm -hmm. Now it was, I enjoyed the fact that I didn't have the, the fiber from the mushrooms in the stomach where like, Oh, I'm going to vomit or I might, Oh, what's going to happen here. And that can happen sometimes. Have you done a tea? Uh, so I have tea, but I have never, I've never sat with tea. Mm -hmm. When I, when I use medicine, I when I use medicine, it's, uh, I, I, I'm a big, I'm a big believer that there has to be an integration program on the front end and there has to be one on the back end. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not going to work through something, I won't go sit in a big ceremony. I'll micro dose. I do find that it is beneficial for me. Um, I go on, you know, six to eight weeks stints and then stop and do integration protocols with that. And so that's one of the reasons I struggle with ketamine. We're giving it to people. We're not necessarily providing the tools, the support network and the integration protocols that are necessary to pull people back down mm -hmm. and if they're doing it at home the dosage is what they, what they want, want it to be the other thing is more people think that more medicine is better it's not mm -hmm. it's you have to be open to it or it's just not going to work and so I haven't done tea something about it I'm not sure I would have to sit in a I I, I like to be held in a container because I respect Oh, you can. can. So the, I, that's how yeah, I just have yeah. never done it yet. Yeah, yeah, I have a shaman and that's his preferred method. So he like makes your tea and you, the, the ceremony before is about an hour and a half. So okay. it's very intense and there's energetic purging that he does and there's mm. music and there's him and his wife because they're trying to create balance. And mm. we did it really intimately, only a couple people. And we've also done like smaller group settings. Um, and then you have your journey. People come out when they come out. Yeah. Mine metabolized really quick. I was kind of in and out in just a okay. few hours. And then there's this integration after and everyone has food if you're willing, like willing or mm -hmm. wanting to eat and journaling and kind of explaining what you're willing to share with the group and then trying to say, how is this relevant? And what does that mean for me? Right. Cause obviously if you have someone and you're seeing all these jungle cats and these birds, <laughs> yeah. that's going to mean something different to you than right. the next person. So how is that relevant to your experience and your healing? Well, let me ask you this then. So since you sat with psilocybin tea, how is that, what was the intention for you? What brought you to that space? So I am fully into the woo. So I want to know how deep this is. When we're talking about a dinner, I'm like, how deep does am, this well go? I, I probably believe too many things, honestly. I'm so excited for this. Honestly. Um, so, I'd, but to explain my introduction to psychedelics, I would have to kind of backtrack okay. and go into where I really started getting invested in this alternative space and spiritual space. I was told my entire adult life I was infertile. I had 0% chance of having kids. What? This was specialist after, spe after specialist after specialist. I had a couple autoimmune disorders. Um, they just said it wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. So I did a ton of personal development work. I went to BioCybernaut, which I think is the most life-changing decision I've ever made. And I highly recommend it to anyone who can afford it. It's wildly expensive, but it is life-changing. Mm. Um, it's neurofeedback training. So you go for alpha training, theta mm -hmm. training, and then a select few, he even does delta training. So I did that twice. After my first time, I feel like when you start to do things in alignment, that's when fate and destiny start to just be so obvious and things just work for yep. you, right? It's like 
how to, there's no coincidence. Everything is very much just a gift. So I stumble upon this shaman and we click right away. And I was like, I want you to come to the house and we'll do private meditations. Like just meet, you know, the three of us, like my husband, him and I, and he, we do like these drum circles and these deep meditations. And he eventually found out about my fertility issues. And he's like, well, let's just do let's do a healing medicine circle. And I was like, okay, uh, not medicine circle, healing circle. So we, d he has all his crystals and I know everyone's <laughs> going to come for me, but he has I all his love crystals. crystals and we did an hour and a half meditation. And what is crazy is I, f so I had Graves disease. Yep. Um, I felt like something was getting pulled out of my throat and I had like a mask on. I wasn't looking, everyone's in their own space. I didn't share anything. So we get done with the meditation and he's like, I saw something come out of your neck. And it was like this shadowy figure. And then my husband looks at him, eyes white. And he's like, I did too. And there, that wasn't communicated. So everyone's like, what the heck is that? I ended I, the next couple days, super crampy. Mm. And I got pregnant without mm. even trying. What? Yes. My doctor was like, I don't know what you did but it worked. So I got pregnant. Oh. So that's baby number one. Then we were trying for baby number two and it wasn't working. And I just felt like there was a blockage of sorts, like a psychological yep. blockage, energetic something. And I was like, okay, I need to go back into the space. So I hit up my shaman again. I was like, listen, <laughs> you're my lucky charm. <laughs> Last time within a week I got pregnant. So let's do like bump it up. And I want to do a psilocybin journey. Right. So scheduled that, brought one of my girlfriends <laughs> And it wasn't as exciting as I thought. I think we all have our, we want to go into Harry Potter land and <laughs> see all these rooms and dragons and aliens and whatever, and be one with the universe. And I definitely had some visuals. Mine was more kinesthetic, which makes sense to my personality. So I was shaking a lot for a mm. while, just a lot of almost those epidural shakes. Mm -hmm. And I felt like a little gazelle getting rid of trauma, right? Yeah. Nervous system reset. And then I was in and out really quick. It was very gentle. I didn't feel sick. It wasn't overwhelming, just very happy. Hmm. And that was my main goal is just to have my, my bandwidth for joy to just be bigger. I knew that I wasn't experiencing as much joy as I could out of life. And I tend to kind of be in this more neutral zone. So I just wanted to be, have a better baseline of just joy and appreciation, hmm. gratitude. And then hopefully in that baby number two would happen within a week. Shut up. I was pregnant week. with baby what? number two. Yeah. And I don't, again, I don't believe in coincidence no. and the fact that it happened both times and I have all of these experts like neuroscientists that are telling me you can't get pregnant that are now in the hormone space. And then my endocrinologist, my um, endocrinologist, everyone was just like, no, no, no. And then both times I went and did an alternative, what people are to say, wacky route. And both times I got two beautiful babies out of it. You know, that's not a shock to me. At all. I know, and I love that. But for some people are going to think I'm so here uh, for it this. just happened to be that way. I mean, okay, sure, no. that's the life you want to live and the way that you want to see the world. But I would like to see some more magic. So I'm uh, what you, I call recovering Catholic. It's like my joke. It's like the <laughs> raised in the church kind of vibe, and I really struggled with that in the connection. And there was just I never felt like I fit ever. I used to get called like all the names. And I, I learned as I got into plant medicine that there is no coincidences, that just because we can't see it doesn't exist. Like it, just because it's not in our visual plane, it doesn't mean that it's not there. And that energy does get stuck in the body. I've seen some wild, wild things in ceremonies that make you question the reality of life. But the one thing I will say is there's a big faith in trusting in the unknown and trusting in what we can't see and what our energies will do when there's things blocked. You know, I blockages energetically, like I love that you described it like that Impala because that's such a great example of the nervous system just resetting itself. Shaking is such an amazing, an amazing way to remove energy. I do that when after I work with someone, my left hand will just uncontrollably just be like, are we done? Are we gonna stop? So for you, how has that been? Because if, if that's the way you seem to work and that seems to be a way that helps you heal, how has that led you or helped you lead into your life after you've had your children? Because I mean, little ones little. And so that means you've kind of dove into this head first. I mean, the results are, in my opinion, you can't deny the speak for that. themselves. 150%, mm -hmm. especially you've had everything prior to that checked. 
So how has that been for you kind of walking forward? Because you said you're very spiritual. Mm -hmm. Well, so I've, I've always been, so my grandmother's Mm. Buddhist, like Japanese Buddhist. My mom is Jewish, but raised us Catholic. Okay. She said she wanted to give us a choice, but she never told me I was Jewish until like adulthood. So like, well, that wasn't really a choice. Um, For me, I have just seen the capture of identity everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's not to one specific group. And that includes religion. I think that there's so much overlap when you look at all of the holy books that it's very clear that most of them are talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. And if you know, finding a community with very rigid rules and uh, prescription works for you, then that's great. Because I think, I think the biggest problem is that as Jamie Wheel would say, we have this God shaped hole in our, in our hearts, right? So many of us don't believe in anything bigger. And I think that that's a problem because Mm -hmm. if you think you are the center of the universe, that's overwhelming and it's just not practical. So you need to believe in something bigger than yourself, that this life matters. Mm -hmm. So if the label works for you, then that's wonderful. I have a thing against labels and rules and I don't like being told what to do. And I think that God is the most personal experience Mm. that there is. And for someone to tell you that this is only the only way to experience God, the only way to touch God doesn't make sense to me. And what I really don't like is the idea of original sin. So, and that's Catholics love that one. So I don't believe that you come into this world with sin. I mean, most people, you see a baby and you're like, that is, that is God. That is the closest to God that most people will ever see is like that purity of a baby and a child. And they're like, that is, what is sin? I think sin is being out of integrity and uh, in alignment with your true self. And that's going to look different to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I think... I want to be able to experience God by myself or with my shaman or with my husband or with my friends and in meditation and whatever way that that might look like in a ceremony. I don't want it to be this very sterile thing that's coupled with shame and punishment because to me, that's not God. And then you can get into the conversation of has God evolved? Because if you look at it as God is the creator and made us, wouldn't you kind of expect a certain kind of evolution and consciousness from a creator as well. So if you look at the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's almost like they're talking about a different God. One is very authoritative, very punish driven, Mm -hmm. very fear driven. And the other one seems to be a lot more loving. So I choose to believe in a more loving, graceful God and one that isn't, um, like one that isn't going to punish you for the rest of your life because you did something wrong because that's not a creator. I mean, as a mother, there's nothing your kid's going to do that's unforgivable for no. eternity. Zero. No. There's always room for grace and redemption. Mm-hmm. So I just have a lot of problems with, I guess, the human element of religion. It's not like I don't believe in God. I very much do. It's not that I don't believe in an afterlife or heaven or hell. Like I believe in those things. Um, I just think that it's probably different from a lot of those books. And I think a lot of it is supposed to be in- interpreted. That's why I think the, a different word for um the Jews is like those that wrestle with God. Mm. And that's one thing that I love about the Jewish religion is like, you'll have all of these people at a table and they're arguing (laughs) and everyone has a different perspective and it's in love. It's a very much a lighthearted argument, but that's what it's supposed to be. You're supposed to wrestle with these things and not just take it verbatim because Mm. at the end of the day, a man, a person wrote that line. Right. right? And then we don't even know if that's all of it. And again, there's so many other interpretations and then there's books that predate the Bible that have very similar stories. So, um, again, I think a lot of them are talking about the same thing and it's like, what is the core of that? And then how do you want to incorporate that into your life? So it's to raise little spiritual beings and know that, you know, you're not a body, you have a body, you're a soul. Mm -hmm. And to listen to that and not try to lose, like not let anyone take it away from you. And I think that that's what so much of society in the school does is we layer label after label and identity and trauma and punishment. And this is how you integrate into society, Mm. right? You basically, you break that child to where now they lose their true identity, their true soul and knowingness. And now they're operating on a set of rules that we have agreed are best for the collective. So it's to, how do you become an integrated human? So where you can function in society and thrive, but also not lose the core essence of who you are. 
This is, that's a hyper complicated question too, because I think first off, I absolutely love so much that you view that your, your viewpoint, like we last <laughs> night, it's really funny. And I just want to address it. Cause I think it was really funny. It's like, all I kept thinking was like, what don't we agree on? Because we kept trying to find, stuff. we kept trying to find stuff. And you're like, I think I got one. I was like, no, you don't. You're I was like, I watched that. I, and you were too nice. And you're like, oh, no, 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 no. We're just trying to be a nice person. We matched at dinner last night. We showed, <laughs> we showed the same outfit I didn't take my necklace <laughs> off. So it wasn't ridiculous. Listen, and I think that's what's really beautiful is there's so much more complexity to you than I love hearing you talk about things this way because so many people, I believe, look at religion one facet. It is it's this and it's that and that is it. And there's no way to to move it or think about it differently. And it's funny that you say that from a spiritual perspective, you're able to say God, because for me as a child, God was attached to Christianity mm -hmm. and to this Catholic church. And I this may sound controversial, but I am one of those people where when we had that hard conversation last night, this is similar. I don't forgive people who hurt kids. Mm -hmm. Like I get emotional about it. Mm -hmm. Full stop. Right. I can't. There's just that part of me. And I know, you know, the, the basis of being a good human is forgiveness. But at the end of the day, there's a line for me. I don't know if it's about forgiveness. I think it's about not holding on to rage. I th so like For the, sure. the old samurai, right? So mm. before you chop off someone's head, you want to be centered before you do it. So mm. there's this old Japanese fable where the guy spits in the samurai's face because he's about to be beheaded and the samurai walks out of the room. So the guy's like, ha, 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 I got him. <laughs> and he waits a day and he comes back or maybe it's two days, um, but he takes his time, mm. comes back, is centered, and then goes... Right. And does it because he's not going to be reactionary. Right. So I think the thing with that is obviously firing squad, right? <laughs> Clearly. 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 But it's to not then hold on to that and, you know, have this acid eat away at you, which I think you do see. You do see some, some people that is, um, they're lost in the reaction of it. And it's hard because it's, right. it's evil and right. it's really hard to see evil. And there's this quote where, we think evil is this dark thing and it's hard to find, but evil is a blinding light and it doesn't want you to look at it. Exactly. Right. So it's recognizing it, doing the actions necessary mm. to stop it. Yeah. We just haven't taken the actions. Go. That's part of the problem. No, for some reason we're trying to normalize it and be inclusive of it. And mm -hmm. it's like, try that in the wrong state, buddy. Yeah, it's not like, going to work. Good luck. But that's my point in saying is you can... There's certain things to me that are unforgivable, but that I don't have to hold on to the malice of it and the darkness and the weight of it. I know it's happening. I know that I can't change that, but I know that the way that you do change that is by working individually with each person to find peace, to find themselves and align themselves so that you can overshadow, you can be bigger than that. And it's, again, I'm not naive <laughs> to think that I can go and fix the Catholic church, but <laughs> the mafia that it is, but I am consciously aware that if I'm a better person, my child will be a better person. And hopefully over time, if we create better humans, we're going to have a better result. The spiritual aspect is interesting to me because I've had to work through that, that, that attachment of God with that and find peace in the word God, because for a long time it used to set me off. A lot of people in the spiritual space won't use it. So I right. very intentionally use it. So, and that's what I've actually started doing is, you know, I, I actually told someone, they're like, you found God recently. I'm like, no, 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 God always existed. <laughs> I found God within myself and, and started to understand that our souls and our energies are so much more connected. And when we align ourselves, it all makes sense. And that's the feeling of God, that peace, that meditation, that sitting in ceremony, Whatever it is that you want to do to connect, I feel like that should be welcomed and loved and, and cherished and just uplifted. And so when my son asked me the other day, completely out of the blue, when I was making lunch, I just looked down. He goes, Mom, what's God? <laughs> I went, oh, tiny human, you're intense. <laughs> and I said, I, I, I paused for a moment because I remember looking back at my childhood going, I would never have asked that because it was I was in church two days a week. And you were we, told. I was told was. what God is. I was never shown what God is. And children learn by watching, not by being told. And so I looked, I got, I have a tendency to do this. He's not much shorter than me now, but I get down to his level and I get to his level and I go, honey, God is you. God is the trees and the birds and the ocean and the moon and the stars. And it is all one. And we're all one and we're all attached and we all have an energy. And when we honor that energy and when we look after ourselves and we're being true, true, truest to our highest self, and that is the connection to the creator. And he goes, 
okay. And just walks away like it was the most easy conversation ever. And to me, that was so indicative of children. It's so black and white. It's so simple. When his grandfather died, who we named him after, his great grandfather, Papa, he, he goes, he's in this bag? Because he was cremated. And I said, yeah. And he goes, I'll, 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 I'll push him out. I'll do it. I'll do it. So he gets down there and he's pouring his ashes. He's like, I'll shovel him in. Don't worry. There was just this detachment. And when my father-in-law's brother died, it was a Jewish, um, it was Jewish. And so it was a Jewish ceremony. And he goes, we're sitting there in the front row and his wife is just, you know, really going through it. And he goes, is he in the box? And I said, yes, honey, he's in the box. Where does he go after? I said, we're going to tape him out back. And he's the first one with the shovel just in there. And what was so beautiful about it was he got to experience death in a positive way mm -hmm. and that it is not the end of life and mm -hmm. that it is not the end of this dark, heavy thing but we can feel it. We can go through it. We can experience it. And then we can move on and live in, live by honoring them and speaking their name and like telling their stories. And that to me is God. And so I've worked uh, really hard with that, with the, the, the word God, because it was just so negative for me for so long. And now when I hear it, I, I get excited. But I think that I love more than ever that you are able to sit in all of these different modalities with it and, and, and sit with God in that. And I think the differences as I've seen this, I had a conversation with someone recently and they, they go, you know, we see you burn sage and Palo Santo and we see you doing breath work. And There's this, right there. I saw it when I came <laughs> in and I was like, Oh girl, what's up? <laughs> um, and they're like, you know, that's, it's very dark artsy of you. Oh yeah, they go right to witchcraft, which I'm like, I'm like a modern day witch. So I I've might been, as well lean into it. I have been called a witch since I've been five years old. I was told I was seeing things that didn't exist, that were fully existing. And people will label you and tell you it's wrong that you find God in that way. Well, no, I find, I understand energy and I find peace and I want to clear myself. And I've seen things come out of people's throats and I've seen the changes it can make in their lives. So don't tell me that there isn't something more powerful at play here. Mm-hmm. And just because it's not your way of doing things. Right. And there's plenty of religions that use other things. I mean, so again, my grandma is Buddhist. Incense are very powerful. Right. right? It's welcoming ancestors. It's welcoming yeah. spirits. It's You're supposed to do it very intentionally. My son does that. So, I mean, we I do incorporate like a little bit of her Buddhist, Buddhism mm. in the house. We have a little shrine and um, we have the incense and the bells and oh, his beads. And he does like this num num prayer. Oh my and it's gosh. so cute in his little four-year-old voice because they don't have their R's or anything yet. Um, so there, oh shoot, I just lost it. Oh, so incense, right? So the yep. Palo Santo sage, you have the old Christian Catholic church that used to actually use cannabis went, and, and incense right. going through. They used psychedelics somewhere along the line. They got rid of that and kind of forgot that that was part of the religion. Um, it's... It's anything that ha I think it's a, it's all power and control because if people mm -hmm. can access God on their own, then they don't need the institution and then they don't need to be paying these tides. And mm -hmm. uh, it's just a certain level of sovereignty and freedom that a collective mm -hmm. doesn't want people to have. But I mean, people have always used different modalities to get to God. Absolutely. We know that psychedelics were a massive part of religion mm -hmm. for a long time. Psychedelics have been a massive part of several different programs. But for some reason, the second you give somebody the tool to heal themselves and not need you, we have to remove those right away so that you're reliant. That is a problem for me. I, I know that a lot of people have become reliant on psychedelics as their modality or their identity. And I encourage those to maybe look at why you're doing it before you keep doing it and look to integrate properly. Because a lot of people, the pro, so the program that I coach on is with Heroic Cards Project, and it's a mandatory integration program. And the whole point of that is so that when you're, you're going into this eyed wise open, super prepared, ready with an intention, set diet movement, you, you're as clean as you can go in. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you the best chance at, su at success. Right. You're going to go through the experience and you're going to come out and then you're going to work with me again. And you're going to integrate the absolute living hell out of everything that you learned. Because the point is you're not necessarily supposed, like you don't need to be doing this constantly. Well, how long is the integration process? So it depends. So my personal my personal practice, people are much longer, but the HHP program is uh, three sessions on the front end plus group sessions as well with everyone you're with. So it ends up being six sessions, one, one, three one-on-one, -on -one, and then you're in your group three times. Then you go into the medicine with the 10 people you're with. And then afterwards, it can go up to six sessions that they'll fund on the back end as well, plus your group. So you're tied in with community. 
you're shown how to work with yourself, you're given the tools to do so, and then we genuinely help you reset you back down in reality and ground you in really deeply. Mm. And that's why I work with them. And that's why I do it privately for other clients. Like I have a lot of larger clients who are, you know, CEOs or, you know, in services that can't be, they don't want people to know that they're Mm -hmm. dabbling. And we will do an integration program for probably two months before and two months after, because I think it's really important that you're really open when you go into this and you know what you're going into for rather than floundering in this idea and then setting you and grounding you back down in reality and showing you how to integrate that in your in your life not the life you need to blow up and go start a new one and live in the woods because that's the feeling when you get home is like oh this is um this is too much (laughs) and we don't want to see that we want to see you solid in what it was that you've learned and how do we take that into your family make you a better husband, make you a better wife, not only to make you somebody better, but to show you the value you have to make, you know, show you how to love yourself and work through those dark things that you were struggling with Mm -hmm. and show you that you are the medicine and that you can tap in anytime Mm -hmm. by giving them the tools. Like there's a million tools you can give someone, but at the end of the day, they have to be willing to do the work and be accountable. If I tell you to do something, I'm telling you for a reason. If you're not going to do it, and you don't integrate properly, I can't fix that. So with the integration, what would you say the tone of that is? So I have, we have this spiritual teacher, we work with him pretty much weekly, and then we do several retreats a year, my husband, I don't even know how many he's done. And he's kind of like an OG psychonaut, went to Harvard, Oh damn! ran with Ram Dass and <laughs> Timothy Leary, like he's just a wild man. Um, and he is tough love, yeah. All day. I've sat through some integration Sarah, like um, situations with him in a room full of people. And when he comes at you, yeah, like the air in the room shifts and it is very intense. There were a couple of times where I was like talking to my husband and saying, this is just too much for me. It, yeah. it was really, really a lot, but that's what that person needed. And I think with a lot of this, especially the spiritual space, when you're getting into psychedelics, that integration is just love and kindness. Yeah. And it's love and kindness. And there's this quote, I want to say it. It's um, cause I felt like it, it's pertinent to pretty much the whole conversation, but it's a Nietzsche quote. And it okay. says, if you haven't lived if you haven't lived long, you haven't lived long. If you haven't realized the compassionate hand sometimes kills. Right. And this is very much Carlos Waters. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this is what he does. And I wish that there was more of it in the space because all that I've seen, and maybe it's just, you know, a lack of trying, but all I see is hugs and love and connection. We and sometimes that. that's what you need. And other times you get whacked in the back of the head. Uh huh. Yeah. So I come from a Oh, like my family is a little rough, like in, in like a really positive way, just like, you know, baby of seven, no running water till 12, came over from war, like rugged people. And the thing <laughs> that I loved about my childhood was that there was, it was a little tougher. I was given a little more stern um, lessons. The thing about that, that's really great. I don't know if you've been able to tell from all of the content you've been so willingly digesting, which I appreciate, (laughs) is that I am really passionate and I'm really stern sometimes. And when I say something, if I'm saying it and I'm saying it with a certain energy, it's, there's a reason for it. So I've had clients where you have to handle with kid gloves, Mm -hmm. kid gloves for sure. hundred percent, uh, really in the trauma, really dancing on the suit. See, I think that's when Carlos would probably be, be the harshest. Well, here's the thing. There's a line because when you're dancing with suicidality, and someone's getting ready to go, that's when they're getting challenged the most by the medicine before they go. Because Mm -hmm. there's a saying that the medicine happens the second you say yes. So there's the subconscious that kicks in. And so we see people being challenged really aggressively in life right before. And depending on where that person is and where you can push, you can tell who you can push and you can't. But then I get the clients, which they come to me for this reason, where I am more stern, where I will shake you a little bit and, and put you back into your spot to give you perspective that some people prefer. Well, they say that's a bit harsh, but I think that there's a line. And I think if you're good at what you do and you can read people's energy enough, you know where you can push and where to back and how far you can take them to the edge. And I'll give you an example. I was doing a retreat. I was working on it, but I was faced with some stuff by another coach and he got down to my level and screamed in my face. And when I say no one talks to me that way, (laughs) no one talks to me that way. (laughs) I think they're afraid of violence. And, but for some reason, because I could tell it was coming from this really, like, I want to see you fucking thrive energy. 
he was so intentional with, with his words. It hit me like I'd been punched in the face and I just started hysterically crying, but I needed it to get to this next level that I was struggling with. And so I think there is a need for it, but unfortunately you've got this, this energy of, <sighs> Everyone needs to be handled with kid gloves. And part of the problem is that's just not reality. Some people need to be shook a little and that's okay. As long as you know who that is and who you're doing it to. It's the people who don't know. And this is why I'm mm -hmm. a big believer that sometimes people over abuse medicine because they're not getting what they need on the back end. They're getting told, no, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. It's like, well, no, it's not okay. You're not taking accountability. You're not doing the work. You're looking to go to another retreat, to go to another retreat, to go to another it's retreat. Like before they even leave, basically. I've seen that with so many people. There was this woman at a retreat I was at, and she was asking the speaker how many times that he had sat with ayahuasca, and he's like, 56. Oof. And I was like, the fact that you just know that is right. a little bit of a flag. And she said that her struggle was that she had to go to the jungle every six months and if she wasn't going every six months she just couldn't function and I don't know what that's like right mm. that's got to be really tough his answer which I thought was very careless and maybe just not thought out was just go every six months and I don't sure if it's working if it's keeping you functioning and it keeps you available to your family that's obviously better than not right but I think a more responsible answer would be like why do you have to go every six months right and how do you get to where those gaps get longer and longer and longer and I think a big missing element of that is proper integration because yes. if you were then maybe you go once a year maybe you go every other year maybe you go only when it feels really necessary for whatever reason mm -hmm. but I think if you're prescribed it on a very predictable clock it means that there actually isn't that transmutation happening. It's just change. Right. Right. And it, the change is, you know, I moved this water bottle to here. Yeah, that's change. But is anything really shifted in a real right. way? No. What you want to do is transmute. So it'd be like turning this into ice or something like that. Right. So that's the energetic equivalent or the healing equivalent of that. So, yeah, I, I just think it's a lot that you lose too because that community can be very fun and intoxicating but it, it comes down to also having responsibilities and knowing it's not supposed to all be a festival so you can and i think you nailed like nail head bam there are programs that are not doing integration people are going to backyard shamans people are going to people who are not trained there's a psychedelic uh renaissance that's happening where everyone's jumping into it that maybe shouldn't be serving maybe isn't has the capacity to hold for people and they're not giving them mandatory integration. And it's, I get it. They're adults. They make their own choices. But if you want to have your best chance at success, the very bare minimum you should be doing is integration with these medicines. It's irresponsible in my opinion to send somebody to go experience something that could be so life altering, so shifting and not set them back down in reality and ground them into what it means and then explore, explore that experience. You know, I had somebody who did ayahuasca one weekend and then the following week weekend went and did began. Mm -hmm. My head exploded. I can't tell you the rage I felt. And you, that's your life, live your life, your choice. But man, you haven't given yourself an opportunity here. You were given this massive gift because that's what I believe plant medicine is. It's a gift to us that if we use with intention and integrity, we'll be around and we'll stay around. When you abuse these things, bad things can happen. And you've seen that people have died in ceremonies. People have never come back. We have people who are doing groups of 50 and 60 people with medicine at a time. Are you joking? I think they get bigger than that now in some of the South American <sighs> ones. I've, I've heard of over a hundred, like 120, uh, which no. how are you? So I guess the dangers with ayahuasca, it's what your heart rate uh, you mm -hmm. can stop breathing and dehydration, right? Those are like the three things. It's not actually a toxic overdose. It's not it's toxic. Other, it's yeah, you're not going to have that. I mean, I've seen people drink. I've seen women smaller than me drink oh, just unbelievable amounts of ayahuasca and just be perfectly still and fine. I've had this much before in a ceremony. I feel like I'm getting hypersensitive to medicine. So I actually use less to really go and I've been completely in space for eight hours. So I think it's, again, it's intention. Intention, it needs to be, people are not intentional <laughs> with a lot of things in life. Yeah. And, and that's something I was going to ask you about. So people are not intentional when it comes to medicine or spirituality or what they're practicing. And they just kind of 
I feel like social media influences where people flow in their life. So for you, it seems like you've been hyper intentional with your life and your choices that you've made. Um, to come out and be this person, you've had past lives, you've had current lives, you don't hold on to your past. This is something we see in the veteran space where we we live this life that we had at one point, but that's not who we are. It's not who we are now, but we keep, you know, dancing back, back and forth, and we wonder why things aren't moving forward. So how do you find yourself being so intentional with all of the decisions you make? I'm glad you see it. I think people I, don't see no it? no they don't especially like oh. my former self so people think that if you get into any kind of any industry that's um counterculture taboo okay. especially porn for right. example that you must be someone who's out of control you must mm. be someone who has these urges it's not thought out you're impulsive okay. you're chaotic you're unwell. There's a lot of these blankly prescribed ailments that they give someone that makes that decision to, so to say it's calculated or I was in control. It was intentional. Sounds very counterintuitive to a lot mm. of people, but for me, it was all of those things. Um, getting out and then starting introducing Candace, which was really hard. And I, oh my God, I sat with that for a long time and I would ask my husband, is this a bad idea? My name was already out and an anonymity doesn't exist anymore because the right. internet, like they're the best detectives in the world. <laughs> so my full name was already out, but I just felt like for some reason owning my real self was really intimidating because the other stuff's all fake. That's a facade, that's an alter ego. You can attack that all day long and I'm not even, that's not a real person, let alone me, or there's no right. real connection there. Where I put Candace out and I'm vulnerable and I'm myself and I'm talking about my personal experiences and things that I identify with and that can sting a little bit more. So mm. it felt more dangerous than the other thing, which mm. I think is kind of ironic. But I felt like if I wanted to be, even have a shot at being taken seriously or even have a shot to be a person, because it's something like our humanity gets taken away from us if we make certain decisions by right. certain groups. And some people will never try to give that back to you. Like they'll never see me as human. They'll never see me as respectable. And I'm not here to change anyone's mind. But for the people that are on the fence, I think I had to do that. It was almost mm. like a forced evolution that was necessary. So a lot of people get st like stagnant and they don't have a growth mindset or everything's a zero sum game where they can just kind of be complacent mm -hmm. and that's fine for them. But I didn't really have that option. Mm -hmm. So it's either I'm permanently attached to this other identity, one that, you know, I made when I was 19 right. or I have to do the really uncomfortable thing. And that is basically be virtually stoned. So... <sighs> I don't know. It just, set, it seemed like the necessary next step. Like I didn't, I wanted to do the podcast. I'm like, I had neuroscientists on. I saw you had Deborah So on. Who's, I, I love her. She's a rock star. And I'm like, I can't sit down with a neuroscientist and have him call me by a porn name. That is ridiculous. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. It would be a first. I had like these really big names that you would know start following yeah. me that are like intellectual juggernauts. And right. I'm like, I can't, I can't. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's, just a clown, it's a clown show. And I can't, I, I just wouldn't be able to take myself seriously. So I, I don't right. know, I did it and it was the next step. And you obviously see the re repercussions if you go on my profile, because some people are still very not okay with it. They mm -hmm. want you to kind of stay in that box and mm. not progress, but it's not up to them. That's right. It's not up to them. And ultimately what you've done and what you've been able to, and I, I said this to you yesterday, and I think it's important to address, people may see that side of you, but if you're watching you differently from a different lens, like I'm not looking at you like, oh my God, Candace, this like amazing adult star who <laughs> then just like magically transitioned her life into this huge podcaster. Like with you said, with some of the, your, your guest list, by the way, is bananas. Thank you. And it is something to be so admired, but I also am consciously aware that that took immense amount of self-love, self-worth, hard conversation to be able to come out that way. So I think what people see is they want to hold you in that box and they want you to be that person they thought that you were. You're this person to me and this is all that you are. And we talked about that situation where, which I want to, I want to dive into where people think that they're, you're their property because they've seen you somewhere. They can act some type of way around mm -hmm. you. But with this transition and with this decision to become this, you know, yourself really not this other person but the person you've always been to put that out 
in the forefront. I can understand why you would want to do that because I don't think it would be a clown show, but I also think if you're expected to be taken seriously, it's it's going to be a little bit different, which I don't understand why, because that profession is no joke. And I think it's a very serious profession. That being said, to be able to book the people you have, it's not about what your name is. It's about who you are and how you make them feel. And at the end of the day, that's really why your show has become what it has. I don't think... I think if you would have messaged me through your other name, I probably would have been like, you're still amazing. I would, you're <laughs> impressive. I think people are so afraid, <clears throat> excuse me, to admire others that come from professions like that. Because what does that say about me then? There's nothing to do with me. I see the person that is creating a valuable ad to the world as she is and always was. And I see somebody that almost did cosplay into this other world. And I think you can have both. For some reason, we've told our children and others that they can't do these types of professions and that it's because they're taboo. But is it really that taboo? Because the guy at the dinner table that didn't like what you had to say because it offended his wife on behalf of her, those people will surely go home and watch your videos, though. Mm -hmm. So why is it okay for them to treat a human being that way in person and then be such a hypocrite on the back end? I think ultimately what I'm getting at here is people are allowed to evolve and anybody that doesn't agree with that, that says more about them than it says about you. And the, the way that you've been able to take risk and not only be taken insanely seriously in this space in which you should be, you should be at the, I mean, you are at the top, but you should have a seat at every table and any table you want because of the people that you've had on your show, because you can hold a conversation with them because you can genuinely ask them intellectual questions that most people couldn't ask. Even some of the top podcasters in the world hate to break it to you. I'm not sure why they're there. They can't hold a conversation to some of the people you've had on. That's just the, that's the harsh truth. You don't have to like it, but that's the reality. I've listened to a lot of your content. You're incredibly brilliant and you are way more knowledgeable than people have any clue about. Even listening to you talk last night at dinner, I was just kind of like, Damn girl, damn girl, when do you have time to read all these books? Tell me about your schedule. No, because it's something to be admired, but anybody who's going to slight that because you've had a past where you were, this is hard for people, this is gonna be controversial, really brave to do because that is the most vulnerable. Even though you say it's a character, there's an intense amount of vulnerability there. There just is. That's hard for people to rational wrap their brain around. Their brain around. What do you do in your house for can't? So we, well, we say thoughts become, act, like, thoughts become reality. I have like this Japanese calligraphy thing and it's thoughts become things. Mm. So constant reminder to myself because I think, you know, I want to uphold my own, mm -hmm. um, my own rules for myself, not only just for my child, but he'll say can't and we remind him that it, your words are magic. So abracadabra, as I say, so mm. it becomes. So if you say you can't, you can't. And we gotta be careful of that dark magic because if you keep saying it, you're gonna, we say you're gonna be just like followed kind of by that energy. And that then is... more and more of can't is gonna happen. So do you wanna do that? You're losing your magic. You're losing your spark every time you say wow. that. And because he loves Harry Potter. So we, okay. that's kind of why. And his favorite song right now, and it's not my doing, it's The Nanny. It's Never Say Never by Baby Biebs, like oh Justin Bieber when he was little. God. So he's running around the house. And he's like, never say never. <laughs> and it's so cute. Oh. So when he starts getting into a toddler thing, we'll play the song and just start breaking it down. And he's like <laughs> looking at you just mortified. And like, this is your favorite song. So don't do it. Don't That's say right. can't. Don't say never. I really like that. That's such a cute way of doing things. But it's, <laughs> but it's also looking at the spiritual side of things and energy without having to get like real woo with them. It's just, it's talking about their magic and their superpowers. I really appreciate that perspective. My son's school this year, the very first week sent home a drawing sheet and the sheet said, I can't do this yet. And, and sure they added yet, but I was not okay with that at all because we already understand what our school systems are designed for. They're not designed to brighten the light of the child and the curiosity and the exploration and the thing that makes them so unique. They're meant to conform, to make a very certain type of human, to then spit out somebody who just will go into society and do what they're told. So that really bothers me. So my mom, when I was younger, used to do this with me. She got a dictionary and she cut the word can't out of it. 
And every time I would come back from Taekwondo and I was exhausted or didn't want to go again or whatever it was, she would go, I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. She would go, go look, tell me if that word exists. <laughs> it doesn't exist. So why would it exist in anything else in life? And I, I think it's really important to teach kids that they have these superpowers and they have these ways that they can manipulate life in a positive way. Moreover, our children are being taught that they're less than weak, they need help to do things, and they're not being given any risk. So I wanted to, I wanted to uh, ask you a couple things about your Japanese culture, okay. because apparently people don't believe you're Japanese. I know, yeah. We had this argument at dinner because Dan keeps asking for my very personal information, which is my genetics, and I'm not handing that over. Well, let's be honest. If Dan wanted them, Dan could get them. That's true, too. He <laughs> like, probably already has them. I, mm -hmm. He probably I knows you, it more than I do. He probably just wants to see what you're going to give him to see if you're telling him the truth of the one he already has that's matched up. Right, integrity birth. test. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be a Dan No, move. he was giving me so much, because he was trying to, he kept trying to call me white and I was like even, <laughs> even if that's true which it's just it's genetically not. not the way that I was raised was very much like first generation Japanese American Buddhism wow. all of that stuff so it's a huge influence regardless if I look like it or not do you know what I mean <laughs> yes I do know what you mean so do you know about the yellow bucket hats in Japan it's the dummy hats right for children? children is that what you're talking about the no. dummy hats no. no I don't think this is a positive thing mm mm, -mm. Okay. No, this is a positive thing that Japan does. And I love this. And this is, this goes back to what we were talking about with Abigail's book a little bit. And they were talking in, at least in that podcast, they were discussing about how North American children don't take healthy risk. We, we don't give them an opportunity for growth or to show them that they're capable of doing a task. We're always hover parenting, you know, these Snapchat parents and all of this lovely jazz. So Japan does this thing where from a really, really young age, you go on the subways and the trains and you go to school by yourself. Mm -hmm. You can go down to the shop and pick up, you know, some bread or, you know, milk. Mm -hmm. It used to be cigarettes. Now it's not. And you can do that on your own and you can come home safely. And the way what they do is they give these little bucket, yellow bucket hats. I thought it was a badge. Okay. No, the last one I saw was these, they have bucket hats now. Okay. Um, and they, they do have a badge they wear too, but it, yeah. it's, they, they say it stands out a little more. That makes sense. Um, and if a child comes up to you who was wearing one of the hats, it's your job as a Japanese member to look after the children of mm -hmm. Japan. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was the most beautiful and hope fulfilling thing that a country was doing. Uh -huh. And I, I want to know your take on it because I am for giving kids risk, but we live in, at least in North America, in this weird place where risk is a little more difficult to offer mm -hmm. in a safe environment. So I just want to know your thoughts on that. It's so funny. So yeah, I'm aware of that. I didn't know it was hats. I, the one that okay. I saw were these badges and the same thing, if you see this little kid and they need help, it's your job as a community member to make sure that they are sorted, that they can walk across the street, that they can navigate the subway. They are mm -hmm. everyone's children. And I use this in the clip show for Cancelled Weekly okay. and Gerard had feelings because of course Gerard had feelings mm. and he's like well no because it's not my kid and then people are going to take advantage and then what do you see when you have this kid that has really shit parents and then I have to keep picking up the kid and then eventually it's my kid and like you right he just took it off off to, okay that's a possibility for some I don't think that that's happening hmm. in Japan we also have a wildly different culture and infrastructure than Japan. So look at their subways and our subways. I yeah. would never put a child on the subway alone here, especially in, the, in New York City. It's not the same as Tokyo. Mm -hmm. You can't pretend it's the same. So I think what they have is a much more manicured, sterilized environment to where that's possible. Mm -hmm. It's also a lot more walkable than a lot of our cities and towns. So I don't know how much of that we would feasibly be able to do, although I love I love instilling the autonomy and agency into a small kid. So something that they do in the system, the school system there as well is they don't have janitors. Mm. So the kids are responsible for maintaining the learning environment. And you can say like, that's not okay, but it teaches them, um, it, it teaches them to be invested in their space and to contribute and hard right. work. And I mean, I think that's really valuable. They have very intentional lunch. There's no phones or mm -hmm. like you're sitting there. There's no talking. You can talk after lunch, but during lunch, it's to be really present with your food. So they're teaching consciousness and mindfulness at a very young age. So I think that there's a lot that they're doing that's great. They're young people are also really struggling with a lot of mental health as well and connection and the average age of a virgin and 
Japan is 30 Whoa. and they are very quick. Like the birth gap there is astonishing. So it's, they're definitely not a perfect society either, but it's, how do you take what's helpful and leave what's not just like anything else? Right. So what are they doing that you think that we could imp implement? And then what is maybe not for us? So I think giving kids responsibility, especially if you have boys. So my oldest son is four he loves helping with groceries, even ones that are really heavy. You can see him light up. So yeah. I let him. He opens up the front door. We get him delivered most of the time because going to the grocery store with two littles is just not ideal. <laughs> no. And so they get delivered to the front door, but he, I let him open the front door. He knows that he's not allowed to unless he asks, but he opens the door. He's like picking up the heaviest bags intentionally and waddling to the kitchen. He's just so proud of himself for this accomplishment. It's giving them those little reminders that you are capable. And just because it's hard doesn't doesn't mean that it's always going to be hard and right. giving them the learner mindset as well. So um, I think that's really critical. It's it's not I can't now because that that's if you believe in quantum physics. And again, Joe Dispenza, you just put that out that it's you're always going to be kind of a step away from attaining mm. that goal because when is now? So if I can't now, it's a perpetual I can't now. So right. instead of I can't know, I'm learning now. Mm. I'm learning how to do this thing. So it's not that I can't do it. It's just like with his jujitsu, which he hated at first. Right. We had to make him stay on the mat. And then we were just on vacation. And I look over and he's rolling with his baby brother. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, says some move. And he's so proud of like, do it with me, not the baby. Right. That's a little bit sketch. <laughs> yes. it's, yeah. It was padded all around. But um, he's developing this confidence. So instead of say, instead of saying I can't, which is what he was saying during practice as well, it's mm. I'm learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting because it's the smallest tweak. It's so simplistic. It takes no extra effort. It is not difficult to implement. It is a mindset shift and a verbiage change with children. It feels like a lot of these things that can be done are so simplistic, yet for some reason our culture or society is so unwilling to integrate them in and I, I'm still trying to figure out why. I'm not sure if it's unhealthy, damaged parents and just the culture that was before us and how that all differs from like somewhere like Japan. It just feels like there's a massive amount of pushback. Well, I think some of it's nihilism. Nothing matters. Mm. None of this matters. And I can't waste my time with verbiage. I'm just going to say the easy thing. Mm. And I think that's a lot of parenting. It's that you get presented with an option that is easy and maybe it works, but it's easy and mm. doesn't require a lot of time or effort. And there's the really hard thing and it's slow, but boy, the fruits of that are going to be so much more healthy and beautiful mm -hmm. than the other thing. And it's not to say the other thing doesn't work, but it's, do you want to come from a higher place or do you want to do what's easy? And anyone who has kids knows it's not easy. Right. So you signed up for a really big challenge. And I think it's up to us parents to do the most that we can with what we have. And I think most of us just don't demand enough out of ourselves. We're like, I'm tired. That's hard. You don't know my kid. They're especially difficult. I mean, everyone's saying the same thing, but I think just change, just change and stick with it. It might not be an overnight miracle, but right. your internal dialogue as an adult is what your parents were saying out loud to you mm -hmm. while they were raising you. So there's this question when you have this like sabot like sabotaging thought, ask, is that mom or dad? And I bet you, you can hone in onto which parent it mm. was. So I think it's really important to be intentional with your language with them so that they can be intentional with their language to themselves as an adult. Well, because ultimately, isn't that, again, goes back to the stories we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if what we're telling ourselves is garbage, we're going to feel like garbage. And that goes back to what I was, I'm, I'm curious about, is it, is it the damage done from the parents that doesn't allow us to want to progress? It just feels like this generation, our generation and the one right before us, ours is opening up to this different level of healing, this changing things like verbiage so that you're you have better self-talk, but then you you start to look around and wonder, and I start to wonder, and this goes back to kind of Abigail's book, is why are we the ones that are so conscious and yet we are the ones that have the sickest children? From a mental health perspective. I mean, that's a really great question. I, it's almost like we we're bombarded with too much information. So if you look at the greatest generation, which I guess there's probably a few of them left. Yeah. They'd be probably century, That was that conversation like we were having in again. In their like 100, whatever. Yeah. Yep. They didn't have aisles and aisles of self-help books and right. endless YouTube videos and all of 
all of these people dumping this is the way to parent. It was a lot more intuitive and instinctive. And I think the disconnect is we are relying too much on our intellect and not enough on our knowing. Mm. So there's so much information that's passed on into your body, into DNA, and we kind of know that. It's, it sounds crazy, but they did this experiment with, with mice where they intentionally bred blind mice and then they had the blind mice mating with the blind mice. So you would expect that those mice would be blind in perpetuity because they have now outbred that, mm. that genetic um, ability to see. I think it was two or three generations in, vision came back. Oh, right. So we still don't really understand the human genome and how mm -hmm. our traits are passed along, but there is information that's encoded and passed along. So I think your parental instincts are there for a reason. And so much of us have this really deep feeling of not being adequate enough or not capable mm -hmm. that when that arises, we quickly push it to the side and we say, I'm wrong. This person that wrote a best-selling book is right. And I'm going to go against my parental mm. instincts and do this intellectual thing when so much of any relationship is feeling and it's embodying that thing. So if you're overriding all of those thousands of years of evolution, I think you're doing a disservice. So it's to, again, take the information that you find helpful, that resonates, that feels right for you and your family, but not to deny that inner knowingness that is there and has always been there. Mm. I think that... I think that's interesting. The it's always been there. The knowing has always been there. I mean, just from an evolutionary standpoint, your kids are supposed to survive. So the species Correct. can survive. So that information is there. Now, surviving is different than, than thriving. We know that. But again, I think so much of it boils down to over intellectualizing everything. So if you're trying to psychoanalyze your kid, which is a lot of these gentle parents, let me make you feel safe. Do you need this <laughs> yeah. stuffy or do you yeah. need this stuffy? Do you want to wear this shirt? Where I saw this parenting advice that I thought was so wacky. She was saying, give your kid all of these choices. If I'm going onto an airplane, I don't want the pilot asking me anything. <laughs> you know, I can pick yeah. my seat and I can pick my drink. Right. That's what I want. So yes, give them choice, but age appropriate right. choices and maybe right. two things. Right. right. They are going to be so overwhelmed. And I think a lot of us are doing that with our kids and you do it from a place of love, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to see how it's affecting them in real time and then pivot quickly. And that's parenting too, is being able to pivot on a dime. Is this working? Is this not working? So let's look at, this just leads into a perfect, it's like, you know what you're doing or something. <laughs> let's, I want to talk about choice for children. Let's talk about it because if, if we know that when we give children you know, I, I personally think children are like bowling balls in an alley and there's kid rails. And I feel like as long as you give children a safe, somewhat wide berth, but something they know that there's going to be a line, like a consequence or a mm -hmm. responsibility they can smack off of and it helps keep them calibrated mm -hmm. in a way where they can take the risk. They can have these kind of different thoughts and questions and ask things that most teachers are like, why are you asking me that? Well, why can why don't you explain to me why I need this when I'm 16 years old? How's it going to help me do my taxes, right? People hate that. They hate being questioned by children when mm -hmm. we know children are brilliant for a reason. So in saying that with with the way that we raise kids and the way that we are giving kids all of this choice and no boundary line, we know that it's hard for them to make, like it's really hard for them to make decisions and it's really hard for them to calibrate. And then you have social contagions and influence. So I want to talk about how you feel about hormones and children and making decisions and allowing six-year-olds to decide what they are ultimately going to be stuck with for the rest of their existence because we gave them all of this responsibility they can't handle. So I think when it comes to, it seems obvious, but it's not. We actually did a podcast and we had someone basically walk out early because the topic what? came up and they just didn't want to go against the tide or ruffle feathers. It was just like too polarizing of a topic okay. for them to get into, which to me, that's concerning that this is polarizing because it seems like it should be obvious. I think that kids are brilliant and they are so connected. And especially if, again, this is going to sound moo, but like so connected to God, the things mm -hmm. that they say sometimes can take your breath away. But you have to remember it's still a child. Their brain's not done. So yes, they can have moments of incredible insight, but it's still your job to protect and provide and to help cultivate them into 
the human that they're going to be. It's not like Gad, um, sad guru said this, this thing, you raise cattle, you cultivate children. Mm. So it's yes, allowing a certain amount of freedom and honoring whatever they are going to grow into. An oak tree is never going to produce an apple, no matter how much you yell at it. Mm -hmm. So to honor their authenticity, but also to understand that we live in a very complicated world and there are things that are social contagions and there is times where your kid's going to rebel just to see what happens. How much do they, are they paying attention? How much do they love me? Whatever testing your limits and whatever way that they are. I think it's giving kids the tools that they are capable of wielding. Mm. So I hear parents talk about sending their kids to public school and they don't care if they have a bad teacher or if they're learning troubling curriculum because I'm raising a kid who's going to be a critical thinker and can defend bad def or can block bad ideas and the importance of exposing them to bad people. Yes, I think at age appropriate times, it's very important for them to see bad ideas and bad people so that right. they can understand everything is not butterflies and unicorns that they okay. do have kind of resilience and they'd have that identity where they can challenge things and really introspect and wrestle with things at the appropriate time. I'm not going to mm -hmm. give my four-year-old, my grandma has all of these real samurai swords like from battle. What? Yes. It's like they're I'm going to need a photo. They're insane. My son keeps asking. So every time we go to her house, he's like, Bachan, can I just see the sword already? <laughs> She's no. like, no, no, you will get the sword. You cannot have the sword. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? No, we've already told you. He's like, but I'm ready. I'm four. Yeah. <laughs> like, You're going to cut your sibling's head him, off. To him, that is, you know, he's a man now. He has oh. no idea. So mm -hmm. it's recognizing the brilliance, but then also like chuckling at that they're still kids. So when it comes to something that is permanent, it's not me upholding my responsibility as a parent to mm -hmm. give them a tool they're not ready to access and master. So hormone therapy for an adult, if you have complete conscious consent do what you want for right. a kid it's not possible right so i i just think it's absolutely reckless and people moms especially we're emotional creatures we mm -hmm. don't want to see our babies in pain mm -hmm. and then you get this professional that says life-saving affirmative care mm -hmm. where do you have those statistics that it's life-saving because yeah. the rates of suicide attempts for anyone with gender dysphoria, we don't see a definitive answer if that goes away at post-transition. Right. So to scare an already scared mom is so unethical. Um, and you should, you should probably be in jail for that or lose your license at the, at the least, in my opinion. Well, that comes back to the responsibility of the doctors. And we talked about that with the maid conversation, mm -hmm. right? It's, we have these doctors and what's the motives behind them all? And are they ide ideologically captured by a group personally? And how does that get brought, how is that brought into their practice with their patients? Mm -hmm. And that is the concern with things like therapy at young ages and leaving a child um, without your adult supervision in a room. What is going to be said? How is their life going to change after? How are they going to feel after? And it, it, it makes me concerned so I guess the next thing is, at what age do you believe adulthood would be a safe spot for that? Because girls, we know their brains develop a little bit different than boys. So where would you, is there a number you would put at that? For hormones? Yeah, for making a permanent life altering decision. Because they are, and people don't want to acknowledge that. But when you introduce anything to a body and you change the hormone composition, it can be radically, radically shifting on somebody's brain. I think that's so tough because we collectively have agreed on 18 for most things. Right. I think that that's too young. And actually on my list when for our, like the beginning part of the interview where we were focused on you a lot was um, ethics around consent and mm -hmm. age, because I find it troubling that we now think that the brain, the frontal lobe's not done till 30, Whew. right? 30. Yep. And we're living a lot longer. But health span, lifespan, all of those things are increasing. So if we know, we, I, sh I shouldn't say no, if we believe now that it's not till 30, should we go back and revisit certain things? Because entering the adult industry at 18, I think is abominable. I don't think that that should have, that shouldn't be a possibility. I've been a very vocal advocate of raising the age to at least 21. Mm. I think 25 would probably be a lot better, especially because it's permanent and you don't own the content and it, the 
social fallout from that decision is immense. It's it's right. unimaginable until you actually go through it. And there's no way that you can weigh all of the pros and cons properly at that age. I know I didn't and I got in at 21. Right. So there's that. I was also on Lupron for a while, which is actually one of the drugs that they give to um, castrate mm. the boys during um, transition, mm -hmm. I guess. So it's also used for prostate cancer treatment. I didn't know any of this. So this was for my endometriosis. They, I had, it was debilitating. I couldn't get out of bed, mm. constantly achy joints. My hair was a mess. I would be so bloated. I'd look pregnant and I was teeny tiny. I weighed probably a hundred pounds at the time. Um, so it was 100% affecting my life. So they're like, well, there's this new clinical trial trial for this drug called Lupron. It's approved. It's been on the market forever. We use it for men all the time. They didn't tell me it was uh, chemotherapy essentially for men. Jesus. They didn't tell me any of that of the potential side effects, which include early onset osteoporosis. They told me I would be in a synthetic menopause. It's not, it's menopause. What? So I went at 19 years old, I was in menopause for a year. Um, they ship you the medicine and it comes with this big yellow sign that you put on the door because you have to like return it and they resend you okay. your refills. And it says, because it has to be refrigerated. So what was happening is the delivery man would have to wait and you'd have to sign and put it in the mm. fridge. You put the sign on your door that says, I might be so sick, I can't come answer the door. Please leave the medicine. Whoa. They don't tell you that. And they just start injecting you in, in the ass with this stuff. And I would have a shot and I would be out of commission for a day just like my whole body just felt exhausted and eventually I got off it my messed up my hips like my um like the bone density in mm -hmm. my hips aren't the same anymore and that's at 19 and so you yes quote adult but I didn't understand nor did I understand what conscious consent really was mm -hmm. right it is benefits alternatives and risks okay. I wasn't given any of those things just the potential benefits and when you're that sick right you'll take whatever you can mm -hmm. get so yeah, at, at the age is a complicated thing and it's probably not going to be well received, but I would say at least 21 and then also subject to approval because mm. just like breast implants in the States, there's only a size that you can go. You, it caps. Okay, so when I didn't you, know this. Yes, yeah, so if you go and you see these women that have insane to wear, and this isn't even exaggerated, like out to here, right. and the skin looks almost transparent. Right. They went to South America for that because ah. we don't allow that. So it's also recognizing that there's probably a mental illness to some aspect of this, and then is this going to have more benefits benefit to this person or am I adding um, unnecessary harm? So in the States, we say we won't do breast implants that large because it's unsafe. And there's obviously some kind of body dysmorphia happening right. if you're requesting it. So we just, it's not even an age thing because you could be 30 and request mm -hmm. that they're going to say no. So I think age is one element, but then also there needs to be a really thorough mental exam mm -hmm. where you have someone that gives you an actual diagnosis of gender dysphoria, not something else that might like autism that might right. be looking similar because you've obsessed on gender, which Abigail Schreier's work right. highlights. So yes, age needs to be raised in my opinion, but also there's these other elements that need to be finely examined before you say yes, because you lose your ability to climax. How important is that for a relationship? It's, it's immense, which is why when sex starts to fall off, you see divorce, you see isolation. Mm. It's, it's not good for a relationship. It's not good for, um, like being a fully alive person, right. can't have kids, that's huge. And then we don't also don't know the long-term consequences of these high dose hormones. We right. think that it can increase things like brain cancer. I mean, that's a really big risk. So again, it's so many elements. I think, yes, start with raising the age at least, at least 18, I would say 21. And then also the requirement of a thorough examination and probably a lot more that I'm not thinking of. Well, we've seen that. We see that 18 is this age that we've all agreed on, but we've also seen ha what happens when you give 18 year olds decision making powers, like going to war. That was on my list. Like, is that ethical? <laughs> is it ethical to market to teenagers? Because you, if they sign up at 18, they've been looking since they were 17 or 16 and potentially earlier if they're a military family. So right. is it is it ethical to market to an 18 year old, especially when you romanticize and glamorize mm -hmm. the art of war? You see the these, video games, right? The video games. And then like these badass men mm -hmm. running through like with a, you know, a dinghy and they're going through the waves and they've got the face paint and they yep. look like absolute heroes. And it's not to say that that's not important. It's not necessary, but it's like a, how much of it are you giving them conscious consent and how much of it are you trying to kind of 
romanticize the deal to where they don't know the risks that they're really signing up for. Well, that's the, I would a hundred percent agree with you. And that's going to be, no one's going to love that, but here's the harsh reality. When I deployed, we had a seven, some 17 year olds. These are parents who then signed their farms for these kids to children to go. So no, I, I think that needs to be raised as well, but you do have that issue, right? Where the, and this happens in the United States. This is not something that happens in Canada. And some people will argue, well, no, it doesn't, but we know it does. Recruiters will go to high schools and stand in parking lots. They will go to malls where teenagers are. They will go these places that children who are desperately looking for a community and they will come in and they will, in my opinion, prey on them and tell them stories of glory and war and amazing things when the harsh reality is it's just not that. And that's what I said on trigonometry. Oh, everyone's like, well, you signed up. You should know what you got into. I was not a military family. I did not watch the commercials. I did not know anything. I met a lady on a bus and went to war. Like there is that reality that that does happen. So no, some people don't know what they're getting themselves into. So I think 18 is too young. I think 18 is too young for a lot of things. We give 18 year olds voting rights. We let 18 year olds drink in Canada. Get an immense amount of student debt that they can't oh, get rid of. That they can never get rid of. And that to me is what, it's almost like they're setting younger generations up to fail in a little bit by not being responsible enough the grown adults in the room to say we know we're adults now where our brains really started to develop we know what the repercussions are if we vote incorrectly we do these things wrong but we give these people this immense power so <coughs> speaking of that power and you alluded to that you got into the industry at 21 mm -hmm. what made you want to get into the industry at all I get asked that all the time. I'm really sorry. No, you're fine. And I don't think I've ever given the same answer twice. Okay. Um, I apologize. No, 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 I'm no. genuinely very curious because no, it seems... I am too because I think it's it's a constellation of, of events. Right. Right. So we can start with the most obvious ha 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 thing is I had abusive parents. Mm. They divorced really early. I didn't never really had a relationship with my dad. So like you can say that the love that you don't get is the love that you try to receive. Mm. And people think that that's funny. They're like, oh, daddy issues are hysterical. But like, what is funny about a little girl not getting the love that she needs from a father? Like, that's Nothing. really sad. Um, so I'm sure that that probably played a role. I don't know how much, right? right. But I'm not going to deny that. Um, I think also culture heavily influences us, which is mm. why I'm really intentional with what my children watch and who they're around. Because... Back then, I mean, it was Pamela Anderson, Carmen Electra, all of these babes that were taking off their clothes and being praised for it. And I was like, well, that's a way to get love, mm. right? So that was probably definitely an element. I looked up to those women like they were absolute goddesses on mm. earth. The healthy side of that is there is this real empowerment and embodiment of that sexuality and that femininity. And I got to really explore that and understand that side of me and I don't think there's anything wrong with it it's just if that becomes your soul personality or like the only thing that you're after I don't think that that's necessarily a recipe for success or happiness um I had a really bad relationship with confidence and sexuality and just like pleasure, like non-sexual non pleasure, just like the idea of being really happy. Mm. Felt like I wasn't allowed to, like this feeling of embarrassment would come over. And I think a lot of it came down to feeling unsafe, like if it's like letting your guard down in some way. So if you have this childhood that's really turbulent, you can't, right? You have to kind of be reading the room and assessing right. who's mad at me or and, right, all the things that you have to do. So that was probably part of it too is... I could either, the role models that I had that were women ahead of me, I could choose to emulate that and that would take no effort, right? Okay. I had been born and bred to be this person's carbon copy. Mm. Do I want to? And the answer was unequivocally no. So for me, it was to lean in and to dive into the thing that was most terrifying to me and that was self-confidence of so getting naked on a camera and being intimate with somebody. Mm. And I was always told, like raised Catholic, my first long-term boyfriend was super Christian, was your virginity is something that's lost. 
that is your value as a woman. Oh, wow. Be very careful who you give it to because that's the person you're supposed to marry. Otherwise, you know, that's the greatest sin in the, in the Bible and you won't be forgiven. Okay. So I lose my virginity to this boy and I'm like, I knew he wasn't the guy I was going to marry. But now I did this thing that I can't undo. My virtue is gone. My worth is gone. So I stay in a relationship for way longer than I should because I overvalued what sex is because mm. sex is a your sexual experience is a vast spectrum and anyone who has had multiple partners and not even multiple partners just had sex multiple times knows that every experience is different right. and you can have sex that's in alignment with a total stranger and you can have sex that's unaligned with someone you're in marriage and union with right, right. it's in my i in my opinion sex that's in integrity has that shame element entirely removed. I don't think mm. that you can be in integrity in sex and have shame. And that doesn't matter if it's with your husband or your wife or someone that you just had a connection with for a night. So for me, my homework was to how do I, how do I remove and alleviate this shame that has been like so entwined in who I was as a woman and to the point where I couldn't even think about pleasure, sex, joy, all of those things were kind of off the table for me. And I was just at selfishly. And, you know, I started, um, like nude modeling at 19, but I didn't get into anything more intense till 21. Um, that's the time to be selfish and figure out who you right. are. Right. Yeah. I'm not committed to anyone. I don't have a family. I need to do these hard things and figure out who I am in the process. So I don't regret any of it, even though it's been really difficult because it's being forged in the fire. Right. Very much so. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's one reason and I'm definitely a better person for it. My marriage is better because of it, it which sounds crazy to some people, but why? I was wildly jealous. You I, were? I, yes. Shut the fuck up. Yes. I don't believe it. Yes. That. Like to like the like to where if I was dating someone if he had a girl like a friend that was a girl that yeah. would be a problem. I'm that just blown be away. I know. I know. It, I was deeply insecure. I had attachment issues. Mm. I had abandonment issues. Right. I never felt safe. So any female coming in was a threat. It was a threat to what's mine. And then possession, right? Because we have this idea that right. that's mine. It's not mine. It's a sovereign so, individual. Right. He wants to get up and leave. He's going to get up and leave no matter what rules I put on him. Right. But now, how, no matter how short I try to make that leash. And ironically, the tighter the cage, the shorter the leash, the more that guy wants to run. Mm -hmm. So... Um, not ideal. No, not ideal. So by getting in the industry, like I, I had to come to grips with this. What's fair right. for me, he has to have the same rules. Otherwise that's not going to work. Cause I saw other people doing that and like, it's just work. It was, it is, but it's not, it's still very intimate and it's still a lot for anyone to get their head around. So I went in and I was like, we're just going to do this thing. We're going to be open because yeah. that's what's fair. And Oh my God, was that hard? That's yeah. when we were talking about monogamy at dinner. Well, this last is what I was. You're so you're <laughs> like you're on the you're on the same path. We're going down the same road here. I want to talk to you about that because you made a statement at dinner, and I went, "Girl, what did you just say?" <laughs> so why don't why don't you illustrate exactly what you said? Because I'm sure I'll butcher it, but it caught my eye. Well, I said it was like I was at this retreat, and they were talking about consensual non-monogamy, right. alternative lifestyles, whether that's poly, open, monogamish, there's all these words for some anything that's not just ironclad monogamy. And people are taking notes. It's these young people and it sounds sexy and exciting and hot. Right. And like, <laughs> they're not ready for that. Right. Like, monogamy is best for most people. It is so much okay. work to do anything other and to have it be successful. I'm not mm. saying it can't be. I know plenty of people that are poly or in open relationships or have some kind of alternative arrangement that are great. They have families, they have right. successful businesses. Um, it's not for everybody and to not, it goes back to conscious consent. Like you don't really know what you're getting into until you get into it. Right. But if you're going to do it, you have to really go down and see how much is ego, how much of it is attachment, how much of it is culture and parenting and religion and what do I want to keep and what do I not want to keep? Mm -hmm. And the reason I say I think my marriage is better for it is because I went from being this very possessive, jealous, angry person that was obviously terrified to understanding, I guess, like, the importance of not taking your partner for granted, which I think a lot of monogamous people do because you think that that arrangement is binding. Mm. So you tend to not show up for that person, how you show up for your boss or your children or even sometimes your friends. Right. So. I think the possibility, you're just more aware of how delicate that is mm. and how much attention it needs to be able 
to thrive. So how much do you have to water that plant? And understanding that 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 weapon, that threat is no longer on the table. So for some right. people, if there's infidelity of any sort, mm. I'll blow up my family for it. You're going to see the kids every other weekend. I'm going to take half, maybe even more, <sighs> yeah. depending on the state. That's a really dicey place to be. We've been through it. We now know that we can handle it. Mm. And it's not a threat to our family or our union. And Set, marriage is so much more than a sexual arrangement right. and I think we put so much weight on that thing at some point every married couple is going to have stopping is going to stop having sex and they're going to stop forever right you're not going to keep going into your 80s you're gonna have heart problems some people can go longer than right. others but at some point if you're together long enough right. it's going to stop so what else is that relationship and yes sex can be spiritual can be wildly connective and something that is sacred but that doesn't mean that it has to look the same for everybody else and it's understanding again you can have really shitty sex with someone you're in a marriage with and then you can have really intense spiritual connective sex within a marriage as well so it's like it's going into the thing with alignment and the removal of shame and Mm. yeah it's just it's not for everybody but people will be so quick to say that, you know, I'm unlovable and I'm not all of these things or my husband's DMs are totally filled with a lot of love letters as well. But every relationship is, should be curated to the two people in it and what works for you and what doesn't. And I see our relationship as way stronger than most around me because again, like we've been through a lot. We know everything about each other. We've had to deal with our own demons and each other's demons and still show up for each other at the end of the, at the end of the day. But it seems like it takes a specific type of partner because I don't know that maybe both are always feeling it in a relationship. And I, I, I do see that with people who try it and it's more one-sided. Well, the statistics on that. So Ayla has done really good polling okay. on this. The couples that do the best are fully into whatever they're doing. So it's not as a a lot of people will dabble as a Band-Aid. It's almost like the kids that get a puppy or have a child to Mm. fix the relationship. It's not a good idea. Right. So they're like, if we just introduce another person in the relationship, surely it'll be fixed. Well, not (laughs) at all. No. Now there's this whole other can of worms and it takes a lot of work. So you have to be whole and solid before Mm. you do any of these really big things. So it's being fully into monogamy or fully into all whatever it is and not kind of, um, like dressing it up okay uh what's the word like cosplaying yeah essentially it's like right. you're doing it because it's hot and interesting it makes you artsy right it's complicated and it's tough and you have to be able to go through it and know why you're doing it mm. um so for some people it works and then other people it's going to break your relationship so you have to ask why you're going into it and are right. you fully committed to all of it because it's not all fun and exciting and sweaty and hot there's also afterwards and you're like right where you spend I you're talking to that girl too much or what are you doing over it's this really deep right. trust too well and that, that's that. what I was going to ask you as well I mean you guys have been married was it 14 years you said together for 14 married eight okay so mm-hmm. you've been together quite a long time and so have you always been open mm you were monogamous for a good chunk of that time? Yeah. Okay. A good chunk. So what brought what brought that forward? I know I'm getting really personal um, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to. I just find it fascinating. I've been with my husband for 14 years as well. And so it's, I don't hear a lot. First off, I don't hear a lot of marriages past 10 years to be <laughs> completely transparent. But then to hear it and then hear that you've gone from this state to this evolved state because it's evolution, you were changing. What brought that on? Again, what was what was happening before wasn't healthy. Okay. So when I was when we were monogamous, it, I was not a healthy monogamous person. Okay. I was uh, I was again super possessive, and it like the worst kind of way. Mm-hmm. So by making everything even and opening up the relationship, it challenged me, and I could have crumbled, and I could have left, and he could have left. Mm-hmm. But we both decided that we wanted each other and to figure it out, and it it was going through the pain points because knowing on the other side that that was worth it. Mm. And I think that was the, I had to do something really radical to change because my why it was so deep, right? Mm. All of the women around me were the same way, just an unhealthy level of attachment and anger and Mm. jealousy. So that's from birth to, you know, early adulthood. That's a lot of undoing. So I had something, right. I had to light the bitch on fire. You really did have to set it and to burn say, that thing I down. I don't want to do that anymore. And then to really know, like you can intellectually know, okay, it's like 
he's just, it's one time. Does it really threaten the relationship? Does it, right. it doesn't necessarily need to mean anything versus embodying it, feeling it, and then knowing it and then seeing it hasn't taken a toll on our relationship at all. Right. So, it, it, and again, it helped because it made me overcome all of those bad behaviors. Is there, do you ever have concern? Like, it seems like there has to be a lot of parameters and rules around this yeah. and boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so I can imagine those had to be really thought out and, you know, talked about really intensely to make sure that everyone was being respectful. So I guess, like you said, you would have to have an immense amount of trust for yourself and that person to know that, because I think the biggest fear when I've heard others discuss this is very much, well, what if they just fall in love with someone else and then they want to leave into that? How often does that happen within I don't monogamous know. containers? Exactly, exactly. All the time. Constantly. So Esther Perel has this funny line that she says, so monogamy used to be one person until you died. Then right. monogamy became one person had a time okay. <laughs> and now we have these other relationships. Right. So relationships have constantly evolved with time. And then on average back, you know, back in the colonial era, marriages lasted 10 years before one person died. Right. So we're right. living in uncharted territories. So right. to say that this is the only way that was the only way back when someone died within a decade, <laughs> like almost certainly, <laughs> almost certainly. Right. So I think we do need to assess like what does my relationship need to go the distance because there hasn't been this distance before mm. you meet at 18. That's a long way to a hundred. Oh, yeah. Even if you say 70, but most right. people are going to go past 70. I think our generation should easily oh, hit a sure. hundred for sure. Easily. So uncharted waters don't yeah. pretend anyone has the answers and if you think you do for a second google james webb telescope look at that <laughs> and then let's pretend that we know anything definitively right okay so i think it's up to you to decide what is integrity within your relationship mm. and what is going to be what is going to get you to that goal that you both want at the end of the day so is it monogamy period beautiful do that right is it okay, well, people used to be married for 10 years before someone died. We're going to be married for 80 before someone dies. <laughs> what happens if someone slips up? Is it a slip up? Right. Decide what you want. And again, there's so many relationships that are alternative that are fine, mm. but it's you can't have it all at the same time. Right. So if you're partying and socializing and you've got 10 paramours and you've got kids and you've got a business and then you've got hot, that's too much for anybody. Right. So it's prior prioritizing what's important at the time for you right. and showing up in a non-selfish way for what is your, um, your responsibilities mm. first, which is why I say, if you're going to do it, make sure that you're in this really strong place because your responsibility is to your partner and to right. your family. It's not to, you know, your feelings at the time and right. these, um, more like, uh, animalistic urges that we have. Right. It's, it's just really fascinating because you seem like you've, I don't think anybody has it perfect, but it seems like you've found us, you've struck a really good balance within your family, within yourself from what I've been able to gather. So at what point, I mean, I suppose your husband knew the business you were in. Mm -hmm. So how has that been? And what is that like? He is like the weirdest person I've, <laughs> I've ever met in my life. And I mean that as a compliment. Like there's right. there's no one like him. And if there's something that someone tells him he can't do or that it's the hardest thing, he's like, okay, I'm going to go do that thing. Okay. You know, that's the thing he's going to go master. So everyone was like, you can't be with her, let alone marry her. What are you doing? And I think the hardest part was everyone else's feedback that mm. was not even asked for, but everyone felt necessary to give. And I, he sat with it enough. And the thing that he's kind of explained to me is this idea of compersion and compersion okay. is experiencing joy or happiness for someone else's joy and happiness. Mm. So not trying to clip my wings, not trying to control me and understanding if by doing that, the potential for resentment was super high. Right. So she's going to, I need to let her do what she thinks she needs to do and whether or not he's there for the whole ride, that's up in the air. He never promised I'm going to stick this out. This is, I'm going to be okay. It was something neither of us had done or even seen modeled for us. So I went into it knowing the risk and I just, maybe it was cause I was so young and you have that naivete and you're like, it'll work out. It's going to be, <laughs> be fine. And it wasn't easy. It's not to minimize it cause there were tons of fights. We took months off of talking to each other. I was in LA. He was in South Carolina 
we did our own thing for a little bit and I don't know. I mean, think every relationship goes through the, you're together, you're apart, you're together, you're apart. One person's chasing, one person's chasing. And then it's to make those less frequent mm. and to get into a place where you're not really competing for each other's loves, but you're just on the ride together. Um, so it was really hard. But again, I think we were, we went through so many hardships that made us more solid partners mm. to each other and then more solid people for parents, for our children. That's fascinating. It's I've always been curious about how those relationships work. A friend of mine is a dom and she is a good one <laughs> and she is hot as hell. And she's this over six foot tall goddess before she puts heels on. So when I stand beside her, I just feel like a toy. I'm like, well, what's happening yeah. right now? <laughs> but anyway, she's, she's in a relationship with a friend of mine and they have, I've never seen them so happy, you know, and, and her lifestyle is so conducive to the space that he's in. But like, he seems so genuinely fulfilled and they seem so genuinely happy. And I always wonder how that balance works when you're in this space and you are doing this as a profession. Because like you said, when you're, you're acting, it's, and I think people don't understand that. Like, how could you be acting? That's your body. What are you talking about? You're having sex with people on camera, but you're acting. It is a persona for you. Mm -hmm. So when you got into the space and that persona started to develop, at what point did you start to go, you know, maybe I want to branch. I want to, I want to do more than this. Cause I don't think it's, I want to be more than this. I think it's, I just want to do more than this. Well, I, so I got out. I don't even remember what year I got out. I was a contract star and I'm okay. pretty much, it was a dying breed. It didn't really, you didn't get offered contracts. It was very rare. Okay. It was too expensive for the studios and um, it just didn't make financial sense. So the idea of like a porn star was very quickly fading. Okay. And I think now it's pretty much gone. I think my generation is the, like the last one. And then you have the OnlyFans girls and influencers. Okay. Um, so I was contracted to contract to contract. And I started to see stuff on sets I didn't like. I saw girls getting taken advantage of. I was being my boundaries were getting intentionally nudged all the time because mm. they were hoping one day I would say no. Or I would say yes, and I said no a lot. And I eventually went to social media about one thing, and I took a picture of the script, and I'm like, of course, this is the script, and they're not letting me choose this. And um, I got a call from the head office in Montreal, and they're like, your no contract is terminated. Mm. And porn is very much a monopoly here in the West. It's one company that owns all the big studios. So then I got blacklisted. Oh, Jesus. And... I, st I don't regret it at all. I 100% I did the right thing. I was standing up for myself and other people. But I was like, what do I do? I've got a mortgage. <laughs> I've right. got bills. And no one will shoot me because I, I'm i untouchable right now. I, Which it, is mind-blowing. Yeah. It was, it was a problem. So I was like, I'm going to start my own studio. So okay. I started my own studio and started crushing it. <laughs> of course I was hiring did. major stars, um, paying big, like I had mainstream uh, fashion photographers on set. I had cinematic, uh, wow, uh, photo or cinematic um, cameras, like reds, the whole thing. And it was beautiful and I was crushing it. So I did that and I still was just, I don't know. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm kind of bored. I think I, it played its necessary role in my mm -hmm. development. And I was done. Okay. So then that's when I started the podcast. Well, I started Twitch first. So I was twitching and um, doing like a cooking interactive right. thing. And that got squashed. And then podcasting was the reiteration of that. It's just, it's, I, I, I really enjoy how you view it. Uh, I think being able to see these things as really cool opportunities and growth, growth pieces in our life. Um, you speak about it in a really respectful and frankly, I think really kind manner comparable to a lot of the way people speaks about the industry. And I think there's respect there. I think there's a lot of trauma there. I think that's what happens when you, you know, let young people make decisions on anything, but to see you transition into the podcast world. I mean, you, you said this to me a couple times yesterday. I actually caught it. You said it quite a few times and I, I don't know that I've ever heard somebody touch on it so often, but you have a particularly high amount of hate in, in comments. And I get that people are, can be hateful. I've experienced it. But you, you seem to really be like, no, Kels, just go read those. No, you need to read those. So how has that been for you? Because you're a mom and you're someone's wife and you're also a human going through a human experience. <laughs> well, the last one people would say is debatable. 
Uh, well, those people <laughs> suck. <laughs> don't. Um, most of the time, it's water off a duck's back. I truly don't. I'm not phased. And then there's other times where I'm either sen- I think I said this like yeah. oversensitive, over caffeinated, over tired, whatever the thing right. is, and it just gets to me. Or someone brings up my kids, and that's just a no fly zone for me. Right. So, yeah, I think some part of me has to agree or think is possible whatever it is they're saying. Mm. Otherwise I wouldn't get worked up over right. it. So if someone is like, you're a terrible mom, some part of me has to think there's a possibility for that to be true if it's right. bothering me. And it gives me a gift to go through. Am I, am I, look at the evidence. You have the sage and the saboteur in your mind. Oh, do you, do you, did you hear yourself say that? What? It's a gift? Yeah. I, I'm real. <laughs> <I just, laughs> I, I, your ability to see shifts in perspective is very unmatched by a lot of people. This is fantastic. I'm very happy right now. Please continue. I apologize. I get very no, excited. No, you're fine. So it's, a, it's just a moment that I say, okay, I need to either have a call with one of my mentors. I need to go meditate. I need to journal and I need to see how true this thing is. So one thing that one of my business coaches does because he does a lot of NLP work is you have your voice in your head and you have your sage and your saboteur, which one is it? So your mm. sage is your higher self truth right like everything that you should be called to do and it's an integrity and then your saboteur is kind of think ego trying to constantly push you challenge you give you false information um, to keep you stagnant and to stifle your growth Mm. so the way that you can tell if it's a state a sage versus just that your ego talking is look for evidence Mm. so it's very easy to get sucked into the emotions and say of course i'm a shitty mom and of course i'm fat or of (laughs) of course my husband doesn't love me whatever right perfect whatever the thing is it's so it's very easy especially when you have like six thousand people telling you all at the same time well look for evidence of that right it's not there none of the evidence is there so what am i going to do with that now right let it go right let it go and then revisit it as needed Uh, a friend of mine said that to me recently when i was having a pity party he goes if i grab 12 of your closest friends and i put you on trial and your son's life was on the line would you really is that something you would feel comfortable saying do you really believe that you really think that's true Mm -hmm. because it's the evidence is all around you if you're willing to look for it but i think people aren't willing to look for it because what could be they could they be faced with at that point if they really are genuinely questioning am i a bad mom well if they look at the bad moms also don't ask that question so they don't and i'm trying to be listen i'm trying to hope that maybe bad moms will start asking themselves that question but Mm -hmm. I think they're more asking what color do I dye my kid's hair so I can get attention. But (laughs) when's my next vacation? Yeah, when's my next vacation? This little human is an inconvenience. And that's, ah, that's the other thing too. And we don't have time to get into that, but it's the little humans and inconvenience. There's a, there's a subset of people I feel like have that belief truly. That kids are an inconvenience? Yep. Yeah. I've just seen it lately and it's like parents or. mm -hmm, Yeah. mm -hmm. It's this, and again, I think it's this, this self-love, these, these self-worth conversations within these parents. They don't think their value is inherently there as being a parent. They don't see that as a, as a self-worth thing, like that you are worthy, right? If you're having these children, you're, you're probably, I'm, I'm optimistic that some people are worthy of them. I understand not everyone is worthy of the children they have, but I think it gives you an opportunity when those questions come up and you start to ask yourself these things. And I just, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that more parents will stop for a second and look at why they're maybe pushing things on their children or directing them. And where is it coming from, from from their, from themselves? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's one of the biggest problems we have in the world right now is a lot of the issues are caused by people who are unhealthy and unwell and unwilling to look that in the mirror and go, Ooh, don't like what I see there. Well, how much of it is even fixable, hmm. right? And not to be a wet blanket, but no, if you no, do have fine. someone that has borderline personality disorder right. or is a true narcissist, not in mm. like the overused way that we say it, an right. actual, right, or possesses some high quality of antisocial behavior or a, a dark, dark triad of traits, right? Machiavellian, Machiavellian, there it is. Um, we think those are incurable obviously we don't know much of anything but that is what is kind of agreed upon within the community so Mm -hmm. if you do have someone that has one of these disorders 
is there's no amount of podcast books or anything that is right. going to make them change. And that poor little one is just, it's there for a reason. And hopefully they're stronger on the other side. But I don't know that those people are going to have a come to Jesus moment. No. Some people, it's just this idea of worshiping false gods. So it's these parents that are worshiping, can I go on a vacation so I can post it? And I want right. to go to this fancy dinner and not be bothered and whatever. It's worshiping these things that really don't have any real value to mm -hmm. them. But in the moment, it's gratifying. and It's a quick, easy fix because you don't love yourself. So you're supplementing that with things and experiences right. instead of the real thing. The most gratifying thing is the most thing that requires the thing that requires the most out of you, which is your attention, your love, your um, patience, your growth. So it's the things that challenge us the most, I think, that give us the most meaning and fulfillment, mm -hmm. but that's hard. And it's much easier to go grab a margarita and book <laughs> something on Expedia. Right. So I think you have these selfish parents that um, they just don't want to do the work because it's an inside job. And yeah. rather than say, oh, I, I don't love myself right. and that's making me show up as a worse parent, it's I'll just do another trip. I'll just buy another bag. It's fine. Right. Get out of here, kid. Yeah, that's right. You're here. I get it. Mm -hmm. And I can't put you back in. So mm -hmm. we exist together now. Mm -hmm. Oh, Candace, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. I it's been so much fun. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, me too. It's very rare that you get to sit across from another female that is really willing to be vulnerable, willing to have incredibly hard conversations. You're one of the, I would say, the absolute top females that is willing to have incredibly difficult conversations. And when you come to the table, you come with facts and you come with data and you're not just, um, it's great to like talk about Palestine, but can we talk about it? You're really, you, you, my gosh, it's, it's been a true honor to be able to sit. I'm so glad you decided to do it in person. Me too. Oh, it's just so much better. And I've just enjoyed the company and just getting to know you at the depths of your core, because I think ultimately you're, you're a lot more than people want to give you credit for and in a lot of different ways. And that is to be admired. And the fact that you've been so willing to come out the way you have and put yourself on the line because you have got to have some thick ass skin because I'm telling you right now, I talked to my husband about you last night for like an hour and I was like, I just don't know how she does it. It is insane, but it's important and it's needed and it's necessary. And, and yeah, there's not a lot of people that can hold a candle to you. So I, I appreciate the opportunity and I'm just glad that we got to sit down and talk. Oh my gosh. And I can't even begin to thank you enough for taking the time to come here and um, organize this. I know it hasn't been the easiest and back and forth and you have a wildly loyal fan base, which I've seen. I've, I've seen some other stuff, but if grand scale people support you, they recognize the good that you're doing. It's immensely powerful and necessary. Again, one of the only female voices within your space, which is really crucial because it offers an important perspective shift, which, you know, there's not a lot of. So don't let people try to tear you down. I think you're a very necessary voice and thank, thank you, you so much. So where can people find and support you, follow you? All yeah, absolutely. So I host a show called, which this is also on the Brass yeah. and Unity podcast. Um, we have episodes a uh, couple times a week and we talk to brilliant people like yourself. We talk about your lives and everything that's amazing in them. And you can find that on every different platform, YouTube, all over the place. Uh, my coaching and speaking website's just kelseysharon.com. And then my brand website's Brass and Unity. And then the book is everywhere. Please go buy it. It's lovely. Yeah. And the jewelry is amazing. Thanks. I was, I was decked <laughs> out. <laughs> we couldn't be in the exact change. outfits. Yeah. 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 Well, what um, about you, darling? Uh, so for me, chatting with Candace.com has all my Candace socials, my podcast, um, cause Horback is hard to spell. It's not, it's <laughs> It's yeah. available on every platform, including YouTube. And yeah, that's, that's my main project at the time. I love it. Yeah. I'm here for it. And anything Thanks. else we can do, please let us know. Same. Yay. We Bye, did everybody. it. <laughs> oh, and look, we did it in the time frame. Look at us go. 